Hello guys and welcome back to you in this new section. In this section we will be focusing on decoration. Now decoration is actually an advanced technique in Python and it is wrapping functions inside each other. A lot of libraries like unit test, like flask, use decoration heavily in their syntax. So it's really important to at least grasp the concept of decoration. Now, I'm not going to jump into decoration directly. I'm going to be doing a gentle start on decoration by first seeing how we can pass functions to functions in Python. Now, you might ask, why would I want to pass a function to a function? Let's assume that I have multiple functions that calculate a certain formula, and I have a third function that, let's say, decorates and to print a nice report for whatever formula I have. Let me give you an example. Let's say here that I am defining a function called calculate formula. This is formula one, and we are passing it to variables, right? Let's say that this function returns x times y plus x divided by two plus two, okay? It just returns this formula. Now let's say that I have a second function called calculate formula 2. Also takes x and y, but this one returns a totally different formula. It's like x times x times x plus y times y times y plus x plus y plus 10. Okay, it 10 here. Okay, this could be anything actually. Now, usually, if I am going to call this function, I would say uh, c1 is equal to calculate formula 1 and I would pass it to numbers like 2 and 2 maybe and here c2 is equal to let's say calculate formula 2 and then I will be passing 3 and 3 here I'm calling this function and then this function okay let's print c1 and c2 okay here we have a typo okay we forgot to say return here all right, so here we are returning 7, and here we are returning 70. Okay, we still did not really talk about passing function to a function. Now, let's say that I have a function here that is going to give me a nice output. Okay, I'm going to say here, print output report. Even though it's not really a report, but just let's demonstrate what we are talking about. I'm going to be passing this a function and its parameter. Okay, the function and its parameter. Now, this function is going to do the following. It will say x is equal to function, whatever it is, and I'm putting the parameters in. Here, it's like decomposing function name and functionality and its parameters. Okay, so here I'm saying x is equal to the function I sent, and I'm passing the parameters I sent as well. Now, I'm going to be printing the report. Let's say print. Let's do some dashes, maybe. This is a report for your formula, maybe. And then let's print something else. Print uh, your x variable is something. Here I will be passing x. I will do the same for y, maybe. I need to put commas here. Okay, and then here I will be printing the result of your formula is, and then I would be passing x. All right, uh, let's not call this x actually, let's call it z. All right, so this is z. So this is like a report, right? And I don't want to put this report here because the report might change, and I don't want to change my formula function. I could just create a function specifically for formatting, right? Now, let's say here, print output report. Let's say that I would like to pass it this function. I will pass it the function name and the parameters. Let's say this time it's 4 and 2. Take a look. You'll see that I have formatted this function the way I want. x is like that. Here it should be y, actually. x equals 4, y equals 2. And the formula calculation yields 2, right? 
Now let's pass it as well the second function and give it different parameters. You'll see here this is the report for your formula. First number is like this, second number is like this, and then the result is like this. See, we are wrapping these two functions inside this function. But as you can see here, we are wrapping a lot. Let's say that I have changed this function and I added a Z and assume that I have multiple printing reports. All right, let's say this is printing report one, this is printing report two. And for some reason, I would like to add to this formula a third variable. I need to go to each formula and do some changes. And that's a lot of work. See, here the cascading becomes a huge problem. And the way to solve it is with Python decorators. Let's start with a small introduction about decorators themselves. Okay, now in order to get rid of this dependency, let's do the following. I'm going to remove this xy, okay? I'm going to be passing only function. Now I'm going to be defining a function inside a function. And I'm going to say here f, x, and y, whatever f that will be passed, all right? I will be putting all the syntax of decoration inside here. And then I will be returning the result, which is z in our case, maybe. And then here I will be returning f. This is totally new to you. I know that. Like, what does it even mean to define a function inside a function? Now, the printing is wrapping this other function, okay? Now, bear with me. If I say here, calculate formula 2, I will be altering the behavior of this whole calculation formula 2. Let's see how. I will be saying here, print output report, and I will be passing this calculate formula too. What I'm doing is I'm changing this whole function with this statement. I'm saying, hey, I want to update calculate formula two, which is this function. How? I would like to take print report, this one, and pass it the original calculate formula, which is this one, meaning that this function here is now calculate formula two, and it will be just right here. All right, so right now calculate formula 2 is actually this returned f. What is this returned f? It is this function. So I altered the function. Now calculate formula 2 is nothing but this function itself. See, I have changed calculate formula 2 from being like this to being this wrapped small function inside. So first, we took calculate formula 2, we called the print output report, which is this one. We passed calculate formula 2. So calculate formula 2 now has changed. What's happening in details is that func here is now calculate formula 2, meaning that this function comes and replaces calculate formula 2 because this is what we said we want to do. All right? Try to wrap your head around this by repeating what I said multiple times if you still did not get it. The whole idea is wrapping a function or altering the shape of the function. This is what we've done in this statement. Now, let me delete these. Now, simply, if I just say calculate formula 2, see, I'm not calling print output report. I'm just saying calculate formula 2, and I pass 2 and 3 to it. See what I got? I've got the formatted output. See how did we do that? We define a function. We define a wrapper. We pass that function that we have defined to the wrapper. Now, the new function equals whatever we have inside, whatever we have encapsulated. We alter the function, and then we just call it regularly. Okay? This is the basis of decorators. Now I'm going to show you how we can even make this shorter. It was important to go step by step to understand this concept because this is one of the hardest concepts in Python 
and people really struggle sometimes to understand it. But by breaking it like that to a step by step, I'm sure that it is way easier to grasp this concept. Now let's jump to the next video to see how we can make this shorter. What is the ugliest thing about this way of coding? What is the ugliest thing about this wrapping? The ugliest thing is that we have to do this, which is taking the function name, calling the wrapper function, and repassing again the function inside it. Well, this is really ugly. We can do better. Take a look. Let's say that you have defined your wrapper function, all right? Let's say you defined it first. Then those are your functions. Now all you need to do is the following. You need to say at, the symbol at, and you need to pass the name of the function here, which is this one. Let's say you want to decorate this one. You do this. So this is what we call decorator, meaning instead of just writing the wrapper and wrapping it yourself, all you need to do is just Get your function and write the wrapper above it in the header like this, instead of doing all of that. Now, let's just try this. You'll see that we get the same result. Let's try it on the first function. We also get the same result. We get the formatted output. I hope that now you understand what decorators is. We are still facing some issues. As I said, it's hard to expand this. If I have more variables, I really cannot pass them to this function. So how can we resolve this issue? When we were talking about object-oriented programming, we have mentioned args and quarks. We use args and quarks whenever we don't know how many variables we are passing to a function. This is exactly the solution for unknown number of variables or the possibility that the number of variables might change. So now, let's do this. I'm going to be saying here, instead of x and y, args and double star quarks. Okay? And I'm going to be passing them as well to this funk right here. Now we need a way to handle this report so that it can handle any number of variables. As you can see, my problem is not here. My problem is with how many variables I want to display. We can create a very simple for loop saying for or in args and just print like that. I'm going to be printing your and here we'll be saying or instead of x variable, we will be Either we can use text format or we can just do it quickly like this. We will say your, and then here we maybe we can enumerate. Okay, and here we can put a counter. And we are going to say your, then we will be converting i to a string, i plus variable. So your first variable, your one variable, your two variable is argument. All right? And that's it. By that, we have took care of all our variables. Now let's test this out. We need one more star here. And here we go. Maybe we need some space here. Your zero variable is two. Your first variable is three. See? Now let's say that I have changed my formula one and I am passing now Z and W. And here I want to add W and Z. Okay, I don't have to go and change my print variable. All I need to do is just pass the numbers I want here, run it, and it will take any number of variables that I want. The thing is, is just write a good uh, decoration function that can handle any number of variables. You always want to think about if this function expanded, will I be able to handle it well? So now, whenever we want to modify something, we just modify our function. We don't care about modifying our wrapper anymore. We can do the same thing for formula 2 here. And let's say it is also taking two variables, t and u. Here we can say plus t times u 
And as you can see, Formula 2 worked uh, like a charm. And by that, we have covered the most important aspects in decorators. I hope you understand it. If you have any issues, you can write me in the Q&A or in the comment section. Now we are going to talk about how we can handle files in Python. Files are any file on your computer that you can open or close. So let's say .txt files is just a type of file. xlsx is also a type of file. xml, all of those can be opened and closed using Python. So we are going to start with the .txt and a file would look something like this and it has multiple lines. This is line 1, this is line 2, this is line 3. And there are multiple ways to read this file. We can read it byte by byte. We can read the line. Or we can read the whole thing. And store it in a list, let's say. Now, a byte, I'm going to give you an example, is only one letter. Now, every letter in any file is considered or has a size of one byte. Okay? So let's say that you're trying to read two bytes from the file here. Let's say here we have this is a file. Okay? Let's say that the file contains this sentence. If I try to read a byte, only one byte, the result will be only the letter T. If I try to read two bytes, the result will be TH. If I try to read one line, the result will be the first line, which is this, is. And if I try to read the whole thing, I will be reading this whole sentence and it will be stored in a list. Let's take a look at an example. Now, the first thing we are going to do is to write a text file, and we're going to write this sentence in it. And this file will be saved in the same directory as our Python file. So here we have these two sentences, and we are going to try reading them with the various reading methods Python offers. So how can we open a file? We would say with open, and we give the name of the file. It's read this.txt, this is the name of the file we have created. And then we specify that we want to read. So we pass the parameter r, like this. And then we say as f, or file. Okay, so this with is actually related to the exceptions of Python. So there is a topic called exceptions, which we will be talking about later. And this guarantees that we open and close the file when we are finished. So it really organizes the whole filing system when, you, when we use the with open. We can directly open the file without this with keyword, but we would need to handle closing the file as well. This is why with this keyword, we can actually not take care of closing the files. So let's try to read one byte. We are going to say read byte create a new variable, we call it like that, and then f, read, let's try to read the first eight letters, okay? Now I'm going to print this, so I'm going to print read byte, and I'm going to run it, so we have one, this is the first letter, h is the second, then we have i is the third, s is the fourth, then we have a space. A space is also considered a byte, a character. So we have five here, six, seven. And after the S, we have also a space, which is considered a letter. So this brings the total to eight letters or eight bytes. Okay, let's try reading a whole line right now. Now, watch this. If I say read one line, this is a variable I'm creating. And I just say f dot read line like that let's try to print this one so we need to read one line and let's observe the output as you can see right here we are printing the line that comes after whatever we printed here 
I mean, we're not taking the file from the beginning when we are trying to read one line. Because when we are reading a file, the last thing we have read will be stored. And then when you try to read again, it's going to continue from where it left. This is why we need to reset the counter where we are at. To do that, we need to just say f.seek0. It means that return to the beginning of the file when you try to read this one line. And don't continue from where you have left here. Now, if I run this, as you can see right here, we are reading the whole first line. And we are not continuing from where we have left. Now, the last thing is we want to read everything. So let's reset one more time and try to read everything. Read all lines is a variable that we will be assigning to the f read line, but add an s. So it's f read lines. Now let's print this last variable. As you can see, it's stored in a list. Okay, so these are the three cases for file read. Now let's talk about writing files. So let's say that we want to create a file and write whatever we want in it. The way to do that is by first defining what do we want to write. Usually we would define them in a list. Let's say I'm creating a list. It has multiple entries. Let's say this is line one. This is the first entry. Then let's say this is line two. This is the second entry. And then we have, let's say line three. Okay, now we can write all of these on one line if we want to. So it would be something like line one. And then with no spaces, we would be having line two and line three. Okay, or we can specify that we would like to write them with spaces in between, like line one, line two, line three. Okay. Or we can even specify that we would like to write them on top of each other. So line one, line two, and line three. Okay, let's see how we can implement this. So let us first define what we want to write. So I'm going to say lines is equal to a list. This is line one, then line two, then line three. Okay. Now we will use the same method we used when we were trying to read a file. So we will say with open and here maybe we don't have the file yet so we will be creating it. So I'm going to call this file write this now dot txt. Now the parameter in the read was actually r but here it's going to be w. So w is to write a file. Okay as f so now we're going to say f dot write lines this is the function to write the lines and then we will say lines like that okay now let's try to run this and see what will happen nothing happened but if we open the folder of our python script directory as you can see right here we written line one line two and line three now, as you can see, line one here had a space already. So if I just remove this space and try again, I'm going to be having line one, line two, line three. Everything is stacked up without any spacing in between. Now, let's try to separate all of these words and put them on top of each other. So the way to do that is by calling a sub function here, and we are going to call it like this. So it's join lines. And also here, we are going to do the following, open a quotation mark, put slash n and dot. Now this symbol here indicates that I want to separate by putting all the lines on top of each other. Okay, so if I say dot and call the method join on that, it's going to combine all of these lines and put them on top of each other like that. Okay, now if I try again and run it, I will see that nothing happens. Why? Because this right here should be on the opposite side so it should be a slash like that okay 
Now, if I try again, as you can see, everything now is on top of each other. Okay, now this is how we write to a new file, but how about if I want to append new information to that file? I mean, I have a file already that has these lines, and I don't want to write something from scratch, but I want to add to that file. Well, same thing we'll say with open the name of the file. Let's say I want to append the same file. And the parameter I will pass now is A. So R is for read, W is for write, and A is for append as F. And I'm just going to copy all of this. I'm going to redefine what lines is. So this will be new line 1 and just new line 2. Now, if we try this again, let me fix this like that. And we open the file. And as you can see right now, these are on top of each other, but we did not specify that we want to write on a new line. Now, if I simply add this same symbol right here to the beginning of my file like that, I will have my new line. So if I run this, as you can see now, they are separated and it is appended to the old file. Now, let's say, for example, if I change this to W. Now, we are going to overwrite everything we have done here. Take a look. As you can see now, we don't have the line 1, line 2 anymore because we use W instead of A. Okay. Now, we are still talking about reading files. There is a method when reading a file that would prove really important and useful when we want to try to manipulate the data we are reading. So, I'm going to give you an example. Take a look at this file. Let us assume that these are coordinates, like this is the X coordinate right here, and this is the Y coordinate, and they are separated by a comma. And we have multiple coordinates. We have 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 5, 8, 6, 8, and 20, 20. Okay, so we have coordinates, they are separated, and they are stacked on top of each other, and the X and the Y are separated with a comma. Now, I want a way to read those and separate the x's from the y's and separate the coordinates themselves from each other. So how can we do that? We have learned how to read a line and how to read the whole text and store it in a list, but there is one more method that we did not learn yet, and it is by doing the following. We say with open, and the name of the file is called data.txt, and we are trying to read it just as usual as file, Okay, and we would say data is equal to file.read. No read line, no read lines, just read. Okay, this will store everything in my file in a string type. And strings are way easier to manipulate with Python. So if I try and just print this data and I run, you'll see that I got my file, but don't be fooled, this is just one string actually. Okay, so now how can I separate the coordinates from each other? Before I separate the x's and the y's, I want to separate every coordinate from each other, right? The way to do that is by doing the following. We are going to say coordinates is equal to data.split. So split is actually a method we can apply on any string to separate it based on a certain symbol. So in my case, I want to separate whenever I have a new line symbol. This is the new line symbol, okay? So I'm saying that separate these at every new line. Now let me try to print this. So if I hit on run, as you can see now, I got a list that contains every line separated. Well, this is actually the same as saying read lines, right? So if I have this read lines and I just print the data, I would be getting the same thing, but I would be having those new lines along with each one, which is something I really don't want. This is why what we can do is 
just do as we've done right here. We remove the lines, we read them, and we just split at every new line, okay? So to sum up, we just read everything, we put it in one larger huge string, and then we applied a split method to split whenever we have a new line, okay? Now, let me run this one more time, and here we go. Now, how can I separate those coordinates from each other? How can I separate the x from the y? Well, it's also very simple. I would create two variables, x and y, and I would reuse the split one more time. So I would say coordinates, the same variable I had here, and I would say split. What do I want to split at? I want to split at the comma, right? Because the comma is what is separating the x from the y. So I would put a quotation mark and a comma. Now I will print my x here. And I'm going to say my x are. This will print all of my x's. And I have my y's as well. Okay, now if I run this, I would get an error because split cannot be applied on a list. So how can we resolve this? It's very simple, actually. I would iterate the coordinates one by one. So I would extract this one, then this one, then this one, and just then deal with it as a string, right? So I would say for C in coordinates, and here, this will be my C. See what happened here? Instead of taking the whole list and try to split it, which does not work because a split works only on the strings, we are extracting every string from the list one by one and, well, treating it as a real string because it is a string. And then we are splitting it at the comma and at the split, we are having two coordinates storing each one in X and in Y. Okay, now if I try to run this, Oh, we need to put this actually inside right here. So my x is 1, my y is 1. My x is 2, my y is 2. 3, 3, 4, 5. See? Now we have separated each one of them. Now, let's say that I want to create two lists. One of them will contain my x's and one of them will contain my y's. So I would create an empty x list here and an empty y list here. Okay, and we will append simply. So I would say x dot append. Let's call this x chord for x coordinate, and this is y chord. Okay, so here I would say x chord append. What do I want to append to my x chord? X. Same thing, y chord append y. Okay, now. Let me print all of my x coordinates and all of my y coordinates. So this will be my x chord. And this will be my y chord. Okay, see what happened here? We are splitting, having an x and an y. And then we are adding this x, this coordinate, to a new list. And adding the y coordinate to a new list. And we are looping for every single coordinate. We're adding all the x's and all the y's. Then we are printing those new lists, okay? If I hit on run, you'll see that my x's are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 20, and here my y's are 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 8, 20. Okay, so this is how we manipulate a list of coordinates that we have. Now, this will be really important if we are trying to graph something or plot something, which we will see in a few lectures. Okay, so right now we are going to talk about unzipping and zipping files. Let's say that we have these two files and I would like to create a zip file out of them. First, we're going to learn about the unzipping. So let me create the file. And now we are trying, and now we're going to try to unzip this one. Okay, so I'm just going to copy the name and write a program. There is a library that is called zip file. So I'm going to say from zip file import zip file. 
Now the same way we open any file, we use the keyword with, then zip file, then the name of the file, we just copy it, which is .zip, and here we are reading, so we need to pass the parameter R, and then say as zip. Okay, now zip is the file we have, we're going to say zip dot extract all. It's a method we are applying, and let's just print a very simple message saying that files are extracted. Okay, now let's try to run this. As you can see, we got files are extracted. If we go to our directory now, we will see that those were extracted, actually. Okay, so this is how we extract files. Now, let us talk about zipping files. Now, let's say that I have this folder that has multiple files, and I would like to zip it. So, we are going to keep this from zip file, import zip file. Now, same as before, we would say with zip file, same as unzipping, actually. So, with zip file. Now, you need to specify what is the name of your new zip file. In my case, I'm going to call it zippedfiles.zip. And since we are creating or writing a file, we need to pass the parameter w. And then here, as usual, we would say as zip. Okay. Now we're going to say zip dot write, same as writing a file actually. Now, what do we want to zip here? We want to zip the new folder. This is where you specify what files you're trying to zip. Now, if I hit on run, let us go back and check. As you can see here, now I have a new zipped file called zip files. If I open it, I will see the new folder that I tried to zip. All right, so far so good. All right, so we have learned how we can plot using matplotlibrary. Now I want to teach you another way to plot, and this method can be seen in a lot of codes throughout the internet, or if you are working in a company, or if you are checking a library that is plotting something. So I would like to introduce you to how to do subplots. Now, a subplot is actually a way to divide your plot into multiple sections. Now, in my particular case, I'm not going to be dividing my plot to multiple sections, like multiple plots in one plot, but I'm just going to show you the way they do it. So, first, let me import uh, matplotlib.pyplot as plt, okay? Now let us define some coordinates. So I'm going to say x is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And y would equal to, let's put number, random numbers like 5, 15, 1, 3, and 5. Okay? Now, first we're going to define something that is called figure. So we say fig is equal to plt dot figure. Okay? Now, this will define my figure, or the canvas that I'm going to use in order to plot my figure, okay? Now, the thing is, there is a setting that we need to change as well in order to see this plot in a separate window. Before, we were seeing all the plots right here, around here, in the console. So, now if we go to Tools and go to Preferences, and we just go to IPython console and go to graphics. Now you will see the back end right here. There is automatic and there is inline. Okay, now let's leave it at automatic because at automatic we're going to get a separate window whenever we plot something. Okay, click on OK. Click on apply to all existing consoles and restore all kernels. Now the kernel will restart, as you can see here. Okay, and we're good. Now, let me try to just show this figure that I have created, or the canvas that I have created. All I need to do is say plt show. Okay. Now if I hit on run, as you can see now I have a separate window, and 
this window has a zoom, has a move, it has multiple settings actually, and that's really cool. Now, as you can see, I have no grid, I have no x-axis, I have no y-axis, so let's add those as well. The way to do this is by defining something called a subplot. So I'm going to define an axis, I'm going to call it axis1, and I'm going to say fig, the same figure that I have created here, this one. And I'm going to apply a method that is called add subplot. Now I'm going to pass it the following parameters. 1, 1, 1. Okay. Now those are going to say how many horizontal or how many vertical plots do I have. And here is the index of that plot. Now if you are plotting only one figure in the canvas, you don't need to worry about all of those. Just pass 1, 1, 1, and by that you are plotting only one. You can read more about this, actually, in the documentation of Matplotlib. And you can read more about subplots or how you can add multiple plots to one figure. Okay, so now if I run this, as you can see, I have a grid, I have an x-axis, and I have a y-axis. That's great. Now let's draw some stuff in this canvas. Now always we draw before we are executing plot show. So, how can I add those coordinates to what I have done here? It's very simple, actually. I just need to say ax1.plot and just pass it the x and the y coordinates. Now, I tried to run this, but I got that the values here are not consistent because I have six values here and five values here. So, let's add one more value. Let's run. And as you can see now, I have a smooth plot. That's really cool. Can I use a scatter right here instead of plot? Let's take a look. As you can see, we can use a scatter as well. But the cool thing is that now we have a separate window and we have the ability to draw multiple figures in one canvas. So what I want to talk about right now is plotting. How can we plot figures using Python? Python is one of the most powerful programming languages in order to plot statistics. So we can plot graphs, we can plot multiple types of graphs, we can compare figures, we can do a lot of visualization with Python. And the most famous library for that, it's called matplotlib. So we're going to say import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Okay? Now let's try to plot multiple dots. Let's say we have a data that has a certain shape and I would like to plot it as dots on this graph paper. Okay, so let's say we are defining this ourselves. So we have x-axis and let's say it has the values 7, 50, 12, 8 and 42. Okay, we have five values. We need a comma here. Okay, now the y-axis is going to have also values like 1, 8, 80, 17, and maybe 27. Okay, now let us just plot this quickly. The way to do that, I would say plt dot, let's say we want to plot them as dots. So we need scatter, this is the name of that graph, and we need to pass to it the x coordinates and the y coordinates, right? I mean, to plot anything, you need x and y coordinates, at least in our case here. Now, now I need to also show the plot, so I'm going to say plt.show. Okay, now if I run it, as you can see, I got those dots plotted on a plot sheet. Well, that's really good. Now, let's say that I want to label what is the name of the y-axis and what is the name of the x-axis. This is very simple. The way to do that, we just say plt dot x label, and we just put the name of the label. Let's say this is number of incidents. Doesn't matter what data I'm plotting right now. I just want to demonstrate this. And here, let's say this is the y label, and this is the occurrence. Okay. Now, if I run this again. As you can see, this is the occurrence and this is the number of incidents. <clears throat> okay, so this is how we use a scatter. Now, if I change a scatter to bar, bar is going to be something like that. 
this is a bar configuration. As you can see, Python makes visualization very, very easy. Okay. Now, how about if I want to plot a line, you know, a graph line that has a certain look. Now, if I try to plot this as a line, it won't make sense because the points are not really linear and they are not really coming in sequence. So if I just hit like this, as you can see, the lines are scattered in a weird way that we got a weird graph. But let me change these. Let's say the x-axis is counting in sequence. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. And now let's do some value. Let's say 5, 7, 10. Then it's decreasing. 1, 3, 9, 15, 2, and 1. We have 9 points here, I guess. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And 9 values here. Now if I try to plot this, as you can see, now I have a graph that makes sense because the x-axis need to be in sequence in order to get a line like that. Okay, so this is an introduction to plotting using Python. Okay, so far we have been talking about plots, right? Okay, so we have been talking about plots. And we were doing a really great job plotting some static plots. Now, what if my data is live? So let's say that I have a device here. I have some database that is being updated and it's sending me multiple data. And I want to be representing this in real time or almost in real time. So here I have time. And the data is changing. It could be a stock. It could be anything, actually. This data is changing. That's the point. Well, so far, we were defining the X list and the Y list, which is predefined. And I really, even if I change it in real time, this will not reflect in the changes in the subplot, right? Because this is static. So how can we make a live plotting? Well, there is something in the matplot uh, library that is called animation. Now, animation requires you to pass it a canvas or a figure that we have learned about previously. And it requires an animating function and an interval. So what does this mean? Well, figure is actually self-explanatory. It's just the canvas that you will create. Okay. And then animate is a function we are going to use, which will read, let's say, from a TXT file or from an Excel file. And it will keep repeating this reading at a certain interval, let's say, equaling one second. So every one second, we are going to activate this animation function, which will read, let's say, from a file, and it will draw on this figure. And this will repeat every one second forever. So if you are repeating this every one second, and let's say for somehow this TXT file is updating with live values, you will see every second a new data being plotted on your plot. Well, that's really cool. Let's see how we can execute it. Python can help you create files and folders, which you can use to organize your data. Let's say that you are building a software, you definitely need a way to organize all those files and folders that comes around. Now, of course, you have installed software before, and if you open to any directory of that software, you'll see that there is a lot of files and folders lay laying around. And Python has a way to generate those so that you can organize your data. I'm going to give you another example. Assume that you are creating a software that collects photos from the internet. You'll need a folder to put all of those photo files in. Maybe you'll need multiple folders to do that. Python has a very handy built-in functions to help you do that. So let's get started. Hello guys and welcome back to you in this new section where we will be talking about directory management. 
with directory management, we can create paths, folders, files, and we can move them around, we can delete them. And this could be really important when we are creating projects. The way to do that is by using a couple libraries like shutil and also we have the os library so basically we will be having one root directory let's say that this is a folder this is the root folder and then we will be creating a bunch of folders around here like that then every folder might have a different folder like this see and we can put files inside every folder we can put images we can put text files i mean this is how we create a directory tree this is the purpose of directory management and you might ask where could i be using this for an application this has tons of application whenever you are building an app you are going to need directories i'm sure that you have installed some windows app or os apps before where you have found those folders around with the executable file i'm sure that you have installed some uh, software on your computer and if you browse that software directory you would find multiple folders multiple files so all of those are created using something like a directory management uh, whenever you install a software and you you know all of these pressing next 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 in order to install a software in a certain directory well the back end of that installer is all about directory management so it's a really important topic and i'm really excited to start this with you guys one more application that we can find as well is when we have some images data sets maybe that we would like to rename sometimes you bring data sets from the internet and you would like to rename the whole images with a certain string so directory management helps you as well with renaming a bulk of folders or bulk of files so i'm really excited to start this with you guys let's get started okay so let's start with directory management the first thing i want to do is to import a library called os now with os we are going to do a lot of stuff like creating folders Let's say I'm creating an app that requires a three directory. The first one is called the scripts. The second one is called libraries. And the third one is called data. I'm not going to be creating subfolders at the moment. I'm just going to be creating the base folders. I'm going to be defining the folders names in a list. So I will say here scripts. I also have libraries. Let's call them lips and then we have data okay i only have these three folders now all we need to do is create a for loop to create that so i'm going to say here for f in folders the method name in os is called make directory or drs and then we will be passing the name of the folder right so here we are getting the names one by one and then we are making the folder okay let's call this s folders and we're good now if i execute this it will execute now let's go and check the directory we will see that we have three folders by the way i chose where i want to execute this using this open folder here okay i put all of them in the test and i execute it so here it will create folders in the base where you have chosen with your editor or with the base where your script is running okay so these are my three folders this is what i want now take a look if i try to execute this one more time i'm gonna get a problem saying that these folders already exist because you cannot create a folder when it is already there so what you need to do here is use exceptions here exceptions can be very useful and you must use it otherwise you might fall into issues so here i'm going to say try to create it okay we have talked about exceptions in a whole section in this course so try first then if this doesn't work i would like to accept but what do i want to accept here i'm going to be expecting an os error okay 
I'm going to say as error. And then I would like to print this error. Okay. Now my program is going to execute. And if one of the directory already exists, it will just say, hey, there is an error. And it will continue creating the others without really crashing the whole program. So if I try this, you'll see that I cannot create file, cannot create file, cannot create file. Now, let's say that I have deleted the data. Okay. If I run this, you'll see that cannot be created. Now, let's reset this. Now, if we try to run this, we will see that we only got two messages and we will see that data is recreated. So this is the safest way to create folders. Let's assume that these folders right here were temporary in order to just create your project. Sometimes you have to create folders, put files in them, do some processing, and then delete everything. So how can you delete those folders after we are done processing? Well, there is a method that is called OS remove. We can simply replace it here, but OS remove has some issues. Sometimes it is too reliant on the permissions of that certain folder we are trying to delete. So a better method is from a library called shutil or shuttle. So here we're going to import shuttle. And then let's assume that we would like to only modify here. We are still looping through all the folders, but this time to delete, not to create. So I'm going to say here, shuttle dot rm3 okay now if i simply execute this and go check my directory you'll see that it is empty and this is exactly what we are expecting an empty directory okay now if i try to execute this one more time I will get exceptions because the folders are already deleted and there is nothing to delete. So with deletion as well, it's very, very important to do it with the try exceptions. Otherwise, you might risk your program crashing if the folder does not exist that you are trying to delete. Okay, so let's assume your scripts will be given to a client. And you would like to place folder at a certain place. And you would like to know where is the script at the moment. So how can you tell what is the current directory of your script? Well, we can do that by some method that is called getCWD. So here, if I say print os.getCWD like that, and I run it, you'll see that I have my current directory. That's really great. Now, there is another method that is very important, which is joining two directories together. Let's say that you have a base path and an image path. You have multiple images that you would like to store, okay? So you have things like, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say that these are my images. All right, and these images will be in a list and their names are, uh, let's say image1.jpg and let's continue by copying and pasting these quickly. We have image2 and image3, okay? And you would like to save all of those into a certain directory or to the current directory. And if we are using any library like OpenCV in order to write an image, we would need something like that. Let's say import CV2. This is just a, a dummy example. And here we would say CV2.image write, right? And we need to specify the path here, the full path. Now, we need here to specify the full path with the image name. But our full path is here and the image name is here. So we need a way to make it something like D uh, folder one, blah, 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 and then image one dot JPEG. We would like to create this format. Okay. Now we can combine the strings together, but this is not practical and it will make problems 
when we are, let's say, running this script on Linux or on Mac OS. So it's best to always combine using the OS library. We're going to see how we can do that in a minute. Now, let's remove this OpenCV and let's put this in a variable. Let's say this is the base uh, directory. I'm going to call it a base. Okay. Now I'm going to create a new path here, variable, and I will use the method os.path.join. All right. This join is going to join two paths here. I'm going to join the base and I want the path to contain the first image name. So I'm going to say here image zero. Okay. I would like to take the first image. Now, if I try to print this new path, you'll see that my new path is now all of this, including the image name. Now I can use this path in order to store it somewhere, right? In order to pass it to a certain storing function. How about if I want to print all of these paths? Well, I can just simply say for p in image os.path.join and then base and p. Okay. And let's create an empty here list image path. We're going to call it. It's empty. Okay. And let's append all of those. So I'm going to say here. Let's assume that this is a new path now. And let's append all of these new paths to this list. I'm going to say image path dot append new path. And finally, I would like to just print this image path. If I execute this, you'll see that now I have all of them. This is the first one. This is the th second one with the image name, and this is the third one. So OS path join is a very important method that we need to use in order to create paths. Now let's learn how we can create subfolders. So far, we learned how to use OS make directory in order to create the root folders and the base folders. Now, let's assume that I would like to create deeper folder. We are going to utilize the OS make directory and the OS path join together in order to achieve this. Let's first create the folders that we need to create. So let's say folders is equal to like the last time scripts. And we have the lips and we have the data. Okay. Now let's say that I would like to create a subdirectory for scripts. Okay. All I can say here is just do sub for subdirectory and just scripts. You can create a variable like that and then put what kind of uh, folders you would like to create. Let's say that under scripts, I still have two folders. One of them is called the pre process images and the other is pre-process table okay so these two folders will be inside the scripts folder what's the first thing to do is let's create our base directory which is os.getcwd now your base directory could be anything actually it does not have to be your current directory some files like to install things in the C directory. So if you want to do all of this in C or in D directory directly, you would do something like C. Okay, like that. So this is your base directory. But for me, I would like my base directory to be actually my current directory. Okay, so this is my base. Now it's time to create the folders. Let's do this quickly. We have 4F in folders. And then we need to try os.make directory and then f right now accept os error as error and then just print this error okay we have talked about this multiple times now it's time to create the subdirectories this will this section will create these three directories now let's create the subdirectories we are going to say again for f in this time in subscripts, not in folders, in subscripts. And here we are going to create the base path. Okay, so my path is going to equal to os.path.base. 
dot join. All right. What do I want to join? Well, I would like to join the base where I am right now. And I would like to join the name of the folder, the first folder, which is scripts, which is in folders here. So it is in folders zero, meaning scripts. So it's like saying D, second folder scripts. And then I need the name of the folder I want to create, which is we are looping through right now, which is F, right? So this F will loop here. So the first folder will be D scripts and then pre process image in this f then d scripts and then the second one which is a pre process table okay now it's time to just create it again how do we create it we just say try os make directory and we need the path right this path that we have created and then accept let's copy this i don't feel like writing it again so here we go. Now, if I run this program and go to the directory to check, you'll see that I have three folders. If I go inside the scripts, you'll see I have two another folders. And you can do the same if you want to create subfolders and lips in data. You can create a small script that create those for you. And by that, you can have a tree directory and you can manage it as you wish. So far, we were learning about how we can create things, create directories. How about when we want to read directories or modify directories? Well, let's first talk about exploring what directories do we have in a certain folder. Let's say that I have my current directory, which contains one folder on my script, which is I have opened right now. How about checking what, what are the directories that I have inside here? and just to print them out. We can do that simply by just saying print os.list directory, okay? By just running this simple command, I would get what do we have inside my directory. We have data and we have exploring directory by. Now let's say I would like to know what is inside my data. If we take a look, you'll see that I have a data set of different rocks okay so how can we get what's inside the data we will be using base is equal to os dot get cwd of course and then we will say here path is equal to os dot path dot join i would like to join base and what's the name of the folder it's called data and then I can pass path here, so we can explore a certain path. And as you can see, I have a list of all of my images. So this is how we list what we have inside a certain folder and explore our directories. Okay, what I would like to talk about right now is changing directories while we are inside the script. Right now, my current directory is this one, okay? How about if I want to do some things inside this data folder? Of course, I could use OS path join and use this new path every time and just include it in all my new files. But wouldn't it be easier if I jump directly inside this data and start doing my work? So my goal here is to jump inside this data while I am in my script. So the script will do this. It will go inside here and then just do the work it needs okay so how can we do that well we can just say os dot change and directory and then let's say now my new directory is data take a look now i am inside data and i can do whatever i want in data okay the question is what if my data folder does not exist well changing directory is also dangerous you will need to do try and you need to do this the same as creating a new directory you need to accept and you need to print the error and this will be much better because now if my folder is called like that dasta instead of data we would get a problem right here 
Why? Because also we are trying to list. See, even listing is dangerous. If I comment out list, you'll see that we got an error system cannot find the specific data. So whenever we are listing directories or we are changing directories, it's important to do it inside a try except. Okay, let's do a small cool project. I would like to take the pictures in this folder and rename all of them. Okay, when you are creating data sets for data science, for deep learning, for any learning model, sometimes it's important to rename all of your let's say images and their labeling files so that they are matching each other so bulk renaming actually has a lot of applications and we would like to know how we can do that let's write this small program so we will import os our directory right now is already inside the data meaning we are already inside this folder if i say directory list and then i say os list directory and I just print this directory list I will get the name of all the images let's try renaming one of them okay now the method to do this is called os.rename it's a pretty straightforward I would like to rename the first element of this list so I'm gonna say dir list zero what's the new name I'm gonna call this rock number one okay and dot gpeg now let us execute this let's open the directory and here it is it is called rock number one so we have renamed it successfully that's really good now before renaming i would really like to do a try right because well let's say that we are trying to name a different picture with the same name if we try to do that, we are going to get an exception error. And I'm going to show you now. If I try to take the first element, which is now this 13.gpeg, with the same name that we already have here, we will get an error. Cannot create a file when that file already exists. Okay? So we need to say try, except always with OS library, when you are creating directories, always always use the try except method os error as error print error now our program will not crash now if i try to name it something else like cock number two i will have no problem and i will be renaming that file as well let's take a look we have rock number one and rock number two okay now that we have established how we can safely rename, what I would like to do is to try to rename a bulk of images. Let's give a base name. So the base name is going to be rock sample. Okay. This is my base name. Then I have my extension. So extension is equal to dot jpeg. All right. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to loop over all of our images. So I'm going to say for image in directory list. Now we will be renaming all of those. First, we need to create the image name. The image name consists of this name, this extension here, and also a number. So we need rock sample one, two, three, and all of them dot gpeg. To get this counter, I'm going to use enumerate. So we have I, enumerate. Now image is going to be having these values while we are looping, and I will be counting 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So I'm going to say here image name is base name plus, I'm joining strings, string I plus extension. Okay? Now, don't come and try to use path join here because path join is going to create not an image name, it will create base name two slashes i two slashes dot gpeg. Okay, so it will treat every entry as a folder and this is not what we want. So we use a string combination to name the name of the folder, okay, or the file. 
So here we need to pass the image and here is my image name. All right, I think we are ready. Let's run this. Now let's go and check. You'll see that we have rock sample 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 34. And this is exactly what we wanted. We needed to do a bulk rename. That's great. Now I can, with a few clicks, I can just change the name. Let's say this is data set. So I have now data set 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. That's great. This is how we rename. First, we have all GPG files here. I would like to create some dummy folders along with it, okay? So right now, my directory does not only contain files, but also contains folder. If I do this right now, and I just execute it for, let's call these images. If I open, You'll see that my folders are also renamed, and that is something I really don't want. I only want to name those files here. Folders I should never touch. Maybe there is also other files with different extensions, okay? I don't want to touch other files, let's say, with TXT extension. Let's take a look here. Let's say I have a TXT file here. I don't want to grab it and change its extension. So let's rename this again to folder 1, folder 2, and folder 3. Okay? And, well, let's see how we can only choose those files, those GBG files to rename. We are going to be looping through all of the images. But even though the list directory here contains everything that I have, including folders and text files, I can filter them here. I can say if image dot end with gbag, then I would like to do this. Okay? So this end with is actually a method that we use on strings and it checks the last portion of the string. Let's say we are reading the string. It reads what the ending of it. Okay? And you tell it what is the ending. So here I am saying if it ends with .gpeg, then do these operations. If it's not, let's say we read something like a text file, then I would not like to do that. Because let's say a folder, not a text file, let's say a folder here, it does not end with .gpeg, right? It ends with folder, new, whatever. It does not have this extension at the end of the name. So if I execute this, we got an error because it is called ends with. We got an error. Let's take a look. Why? Yeah, it's ends with, not end with. Okay, now if I execute this, this is ends with. If I run this, let's go back. You'll see that we renamed those to images. Now, let's change the name. Uh, let's call it data. If I go and check, You'll see that all of them are renamed to data except for my TXT and my folders. And this is how we do filtered search and filtered renaming. Let's say that I don't want to do this filtering inside my loop here. And I would like to actually do it here. How would we do that? Well, we would do the same thing actually. We can say directory list is equal to list comprehension x for x in directory list if not x dot ends with gbeg okay i'm gonna just remove these for a second and run it now you will see my the files i have got are all the files that are not gbeg this is how i filter out gbeg okay now, if I remove this not here, I will be getting all the GBEGs. See, with the simple list comprehension, we are doing that. And by that, we have finalized filtering. The next topic we will be talking about is CLI applications. And they stand for command line, actually, interface. And 
The question is, where do we use command line interfaces in general? We use them whenever we want to create an application. So far, we were coding like this. We have our editor, we are writing code. After we are done writing our code, we hit on compile, right? And we see our output. But is this practical? Let's say we want to drive, let's say we want to use this application, but this time in a production environment, okay? Meaning that you have a client that you would like to give out this application. Do you think that it's a good idea to give him the code and he has to press the compile button every time? Well, this makes no sense. You need to package this application somehow so that he can run it externally. You could have, let's say you save this as program.py and then the user can just run it through the command line. This is what a command line interface is. And when we run it, we should be able maybe to specify arguments to those, uh, to this program, right? Sometimes you need to initialize it with some data, with some folder paths. So all we need to do is open a command line like that and type the name of my application. Let's say it is app.py and then just pass it some arguments like this and hit execute. By that, the user doesn't have to go, the client doesn't have to go inside the script and run it. He will just be provided the .py, the .py extension, and then we will pass arguments and these arguments will be passed inside our .py application. Now let's see how we can package our applications to be useful for the client without actually having to interact with the code. Now we are ready to start our first CLI application. Let's see how we can do that. The first thing we want to do is actually import a library that is called argument parser and it's called arg parse. Okay, this is the library that we will use. Now we need to create a parser object. So I'm going to say he my parser is equal to arg parse dot argument parser. And then we need to specify what is the name of this application I'm creating. Let's say that this application is called app. By that, we have created the parser and the initial information of my app, which is just the name, actually. Okay, we need to say here prog is equal to app. All right, next, we need to add arguments. Arguments are like what you pass to a function. You know, we have a function like that, and we pass it arguments like this. So these are the arguments that we will be passing from the command line to my program. Okay, this is the difference between a function argument and a CLI argument is that the function argument is passed inside the program and the CLI argument is passed through the command line itself, like going here, saying app.py and passing some arguments like this. Okay, how can we add a new argument? We just need to say my parser dot add underscore argument and then what is the name of this argument i'm gonna say argument one we are creating a dummy application at the moment we also can provide help so this help is going to be shown on the command line later so that we know what does this argument do or what are we supposed to pass here so that the client knows what he's supposed to pass. So here I'm going to just say dummy argument one. Okay. Now let's add a second argument. I'm going to just copy this and call this argument two and this is argument two. Okay. Now it's time to execute our parser. We're going to say args is equal to my underscore parser dot parse underscore 
args. Okay, so we are getting my parser and we are calling parse args, meaning that go to the command line and get me whatever the user gave for these two and store them inside args. Okay, then I would like to print done executing. Okay, it's a very simple program. Let's save it. Now, what you want to do is open Anaconda prompt from the Windows Start. And then I would like you to go to the directory right here, the directory of your application. How can you do that? If it is in C, just say CD and just paste the directory here. If the directory is in a different drive, like in D in my case, I would need to go to D first, then say CD for change directory and paste. And this is now my new directory, okay? Now I can find my script right here. It's called CLI app. So now if I just say CLI app.py, I will get too few arguments and I will get usage app. This is the name of my app. And this is argument two, one and argument two. Now if I say CLI app.py and then say dash h i would get help meaning that i will see what am i supposed to pass see remember we have written here that arguments can have help section so this is the help section i need to pass argument one and argument two okay so now if i just say cli app dot pi and i pass let's say number five as argument one and number six as argument two, I will get done executing, meaning that we have got the arguments and they are in right now. That's a great, this is how we create the basics. Now let us continue. Let us create an application that will return the summation, the subtraction, the multiplication, and the division of any two numbers okay it will display four results this means that we need two arguments actually only and here i'm going to change the help into the first entry to the first entry and here i'm going to call this the second entry okay i also would like to add a description to my app here so i'm going to say here description is equal to returns the addition multiplication division and subtraction of any two numbers okay all right so we added a description as well now how can we read the arguments that we have passed i mean yes we have passed them here but how can we extract them now what we can do is say input one is equal to args dot arg one which is the name here we have right and then we could say here input two is equal to args dot what is the name here arc2 so this is arc2 so this became like a variables that we are passing through a function right it's the same thing now we can do some operations we can just simply say uh, print the summation is and then just say uh, input 1 plus input 2 Let's say here the subtraction. This is the subtraction. We have also the multiplication. Is a multiplication. And finally, let's say the division. Is by dividing those. Okay. Now let's save this. Now let's run this app. It's called CLI app.py. And let's pass two numbers, let's say maybe 10 and 5. We got an error because here we were expecting no two numbers, but we got a strings. This is the very important thing. When you pass any arguments from command line, 
they will come as a string. So you need to convert those into integers or floats or whatever type you want. If you want them as strings, you can leave them as they are. Otherwise, you need to convert them by casting. So now we have casted these into integers. Let's execute again. We will see we got this. The summation is 15, subtraction is 5, multiplication is 50, and division is 2. That's great. We have created a very simple CLI app that can receive arguments. Now, CLI apps are way more powerful than that, and they can do whole scale full applications that can run through few commands on the command line. I just want to teach you a quick thing here. We have said that we need to cast this into an integer in order to read it. Now, if we don't specify the type, always it will be read as a string. But what we can do is just say type is equal to integer for the arguments. And by that, this add argument is going to cast it before sending it back as an argument. We can remove these integers from here and try it out. Now let's save this and let's try to run this. I'm going to say CLI app.py and then 4 and 4. You'll see that we did not have to cast if we just specify the type. Sometimes it's really important to read the arguments from an external file. And we see that in a lot of CLI applications. So how can we actually do that? How can we pass the arguments through a text file instead of passing them in the command line? This is important as well if we are trying to pass a default argument that we are storing for our app. All you need to do is go to this argument parser and add the following parameter from file underscore prefix underscore chars and then equal to a parenthesis and the at sign, okay? Initially, this is all you need to do on your program. Now, if I go to the command line, this is where my app at right now, and I just say CLI app.py, I will get that I don't have enough arguments because we did not really specify here that I want my arguments to be from a file. And we did not even create the file yet. Let's go to the by here directory, the app by directory, and just create a file, and we are going to call it args.txt. Okay, add the at. Now, all we need to do is just add the at sign because we have really specified in this line that to specify where is the arguments, add the at sign first. Then you just need to say args.txt. This is the name of my arguments, my argument file. Now, after we have created the file, let's open it and just add two arguments. Let's say five, and let's say there are 20 and four. Let's save them. Now we need to make sure that we are in the same directory as our script and our args file. And we just need to say CLI app.py and then add the name of my file, args.txt. And as you noticed, we have said here that in order to specify this file, we need to add this at sign. So this is why we are adding it. Now, if we execute, we'll see that the arguments were obtained from that file. What I would like to talk about right now is something called optional arguments. So far, all of our arguments are compulsory, so we must type something, otherwise the program will not execute. What we can do is sometimes we need optional arguments, meaning that we might use them and we might not, depending if the user uh, specified it explicitly. Now, how can we create this optional argument? All we need to do is just add a regular argument and then at the beginning of its name we can add double dashes like this okay now let's say that here i am going to be adding a shift number so shift 
is equal to 5 meaning that all of my results will be shifted by 5 no matter what now let's say that I can change this shift by this argument right here well how can we do that let's call this shift optional argument okay but how can I make sure that this shift is changed or not usually if you don't specify this argument by the way it's argument 3 if you don't specify this argument if you try to read it it will be none so here I would say input 3 is equal to args dot arg3 and now I can check if it's none so I will say here if input 3 is equal to none I would like to do this shift okay meaning that I did not specify any new shift else what I would like to do is shift will equal to input 3 okay now let's test this out if I say here CLI app dot pi and I specify the numbers only 2 and 2 and let's say I did not specify any optional argument I will get this result with a shift 2 plus 2 is 4 plus 5 is the shift here it's 9 the subtraction will be 5 9 6 okay now let's change the shift to 0 okay meaning I will not be having any shift all I need to do is just pass these two two and say here org3 and specify it as 0 as you can see now the shift is 0 and I am just summing these two 2 plus 2 is 4 2 minus 2 is 0 multiplication is 4 division is 1 so this is how we use an optional argument sometimes we would like to actually store flags meaning if we specify a certain argument we would like to set a flag like a true or a false we can do that simply by using something called actions now let's create a fourth argument and this argument I'm not gonna specify a type for it I'm just gonna say action is equal to store underscore true that means whenever I just type the argument for right here I will be setting true let's say that it is optional to print the power of 2 of the first number we provide okay and if we set this to, to true we will be taking the power 2 of the first argument let's first extract this I'm gonna say input 4 by the way we can just use the args arg1 or to arg3 in here in the condition but we can also store them in a separate variable so I'm gonna say here args dot arg4 okay and this is optional and I'm gonna say here if input 4 is equal to true then I would like to print the power of 2 of the first argument is input 1 times input 1 right this is the power of 2 of the first argument only if we specify this all right let's take a look I'm gonna store this and I'm gonna call my app specify the first number as 10 second number as 2 and then I'm not gonna specify any shift I'm just gonna specify that argument 4 is set so all I need to pass is just argument 4 we have a typo in the action so let's just fix it quickly this is action and let's try again as you can see now we have specified this argument we are setting it to true meaning that we can print this statement which is the power of two of the first argument now assuming that I did not pass this argument see I did not get the power of two now this here can be specified as true or false so you can store false or store true it's up to you in this section we will talk about the most famous math library which is called numpy 
It is built using C and C++ libraries, so it's extremely fast in execution. So to anyone that is telling you Python is slow in data calculations, you can prove them wrong with this library. It contains everything from arrays, search algorithms, geometric calculations, and everything any math algorithm would require. So let's discover this library together and get started. Now in this lecture, we will be talking about NumPy. Now, NumPy is not really a programming method or anything, it's just a Python library. So, what does this Python library do? Well, you will see NumPy in a lot of code around. And it's a very famous library for, numer for numerical operations. And it really helps you create arrays, create operations on arrays, create lists. And you might be asking, why would I use NumPy, let's say, instead of using the regular Python uh, syntax. Uh, well, NumPy is way faster because it's based on C, so the background that is, so NumPy is actually wrapping a few C and C++ libraries which make it really fast when executing numerical operations. So the advantages of using NumPy is that it makes your life easier. You can simply create uh, arrays. You can simply, uh, let's see what kind of stuff we can do. Well, first you can define, well, first you can define lists or arrays really fast. So you could simply say NP. So you can simply, let's say, say NP here, array. And you can easily, Well, what type of operation does NumPy support? It supports tons of stuff. You can find the maximum number in a list. You can find the minimum number in a list. You can sort a list according to the ascending order or descending order. You can multiply lists together. You can do any type of uh, mathematical operation on that list really quickly. You can create arrays actually on the fly and pre-define all the values inside them really quickly. So it's really a really huge library and it's really famous. So let's get started and write some examples. All right, so right now let us talk about 2D arrays. So, so far we have been talking about arrays that are one dimensional. Now let's say that you want to create an array that is two dimensional. How can you do that? Well, as usual, we will just import NumPy as np. And now let's say array is equal to np.array the same way we were defining the single dimensional arrays. However, right now we are going to open a bracket and then put every dimension separately in a separate bracket. So it's like a nested list, actually. It's like a list inside the list. Now, if you do that, you would get a two dimensional array. So this is the first dimension. This is like one, two, three, four. And this is the next dimension, which is five, six, seven, eight. And we can also optionally add the type. So in my case, I want this to be MP integer 64 bits. Okay, now if I print this array, I'm going to get two dimensional array. As you can see, this is dimension one and this is dimension two. Now, if you have some mathematical background, you would know that multidimensional arrays are very popular and have tons of applications. And this is how you can create them with, with NumPy arrays. Okay, so there is one more thing I want to mention before wrapping up this small section, which is the shape. So if I get this print and just say here array.shape and I print this, you'll see that I got a shape of 2 by 4. What does this mean? It means that this is a two-dimensional array and every dimension has four elements. Okay, that's good. Now let's say that I extend this further. Okay, so right now if I hit on run, you'll see that now I have a dimension of 3 by 4. 
meaning I have three dimensions and every dimension has four elements. Okay, so this can be helpful actually. Let's say you are reading from an external library and you have an array and you would like to know what is the shape of this array. Well, you can do that simply by just saying array.shape and you would get the shape of your array. Now, let's say that you don't know the type of the array that you have because you are reading it from an external library. This happens a lot, actually. The way to do that, you would just say array.dtype. Now, if I hit on run, you'll see that the type is integer 64 exactly as I have defined it right here. All right, so right now I want to talk about searching an array. Okay. Now let's say that you have an array that has multiple names. Let's say Adam, Mr. Hamshaw, and John. Okay. Let's say that this array is called names. And let's say that I have another array that is called age. So this will be like 23, 29, and 40, okay? And the 23 corresponds to Adam, 29 corresponds to Mr. Hamsro, and 40 corresponds to John. Okay, now, sometimes we would like to search an array and get the index of that array. Searching means that when you find the element, you would like to get its index, okay? Because once you have the index of this element that you have found, and let's say you have multiple lists that have multiple information, this index would correspond to all the information, right? Because what's the index of Adam? It's zero. Mr. Homshaw is one and John is two. If you find the index of Mr. Homshaw, which is one, okay, now you can use this same index to get his age, to get maybe his address, because all the information are ordered the same way in all the data. So finding the index of an element is very important, okay? And NumPy makes this very, very easy. With NumPy, we can simply say, hey, I want to search for a certain name. Let's say for this name, okay? And it will return to me the index. Once I have the index, I can use it to find other information. Okay, let's see how we can implement this. Now, in the regular ways, you can use for loops to search for a string, and when you find it, you try to find the index. You can do that actually by hand, but when using NumPy, this is way faster, more robust. So we will use NumPy methods in order to find an element in an array. Okay, so let us try now searching an array. Let's say we have import NumPy as NP. And let's say that my array is equal to mp.array. And this array contains John and Mr. Homshaw and Jack. Okay. Now, how can I find what is the index of Mr. Homshaw? Well, this is very simple. I would define a variable. Let's call it index, for example. And I'm going to say mp where. And I'm going to say a is equal equal to John. Let's say I'm searching for John. So this method where you just pass it, what is the, your array? It's array here. You're saying, hey, search array for an element that is called John and return the index. Now, if I try to print the index, I won't really get it directly. So if I just print this, you'll see that I got this output. It got me the type first of this array. Then here it got me the index. So I need to extract it. To extract it first, we need the first element because this is index and this is type. So to access it, we need index zero. Now we have accessed this element and it is returning it as a list. Okay, so if I print now, I will get a list that has the index. Now I want to get the first element of this list and the only element in my case. Now, if I do this, I will get the index of John. Now, let's say that I'm searching for Jack. I should be getting two, right? Because this is index zero, one, two. I'm searching for the index of Jack, which is two. Now, if I print this, I got two right here. So I got the index. 
Now, MP where actually returns all the indexes of that element. So let's say that we have the same name duplicated in multiple places. Now, if I just remove this, okay, zero, zero, and I just print it, you'll see that Jack was found in one place. But if I say I want to search for Mr. Humshul, you'll see that now I got an array of two elements. Okay, so we have two indexes. We have index here, we have an element here, and an element here. This element has an index of 1, and this element has an index of 3. So we can choose whatever we want. So if we access the first element, we will see that we got a list of the indexes, which are 1 and 3. Now we can use either one of them. We can use the first element, which is the 1. Here it is. Or we can use the second one, which is the 3 as we can see here, okay? So mpware returns all the values that we could find. Now, maybe a duplicated name does not make much sense in this example, but this would be very, very helpful if you have, let's say, an image, a binary image that is consisting of zeros and ones. Let's say you would like to get only the blackness in the image. Let's say the image is masked and you would like to, to only get that mask which is drawn in black and black has values of zeros so let's say this is your image it has zeros 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 this is the object and then you have some background and then you have some object and you would like to extract only the object without the background well in order to extract that you can use mpware to get all the indexes of all the pixels that are black, let's say. So mpware is a really powerful method for NumPy. Now let us continue with NumPy methods. And now we are going to learn how can we find the maximum and the minimum element using NumPy. Usually we would use for loops and algorithms in order to find the minimum and the maximum number but since python is great for fast prototyping we can do that with a simple method let's say that i have an array and it has elements uh, let's say like 50 20 30 91 and the largest element maybe is 101 and the minimum is 2 okay now in order to quickly find this i need to define a maximum let's say maximum is equal to np dot a max meaning array max and you just pass it the array now you pass the array to this function and it should get you the maximum now if i print maximum you'll see that i got 101 which is the maximum number of this array now let's say i want to find the minimum all i need to do is just say minimum is equal to np dot a min and just pass the name of the array, which is ARR or array. Now, if I print this minimum, you'll see that I got two. So see, it's really, really simple to find the maximum and the minimum element in an array using NumPy. Now we are going to talk about sorting arrays in an ascending or in a descending way. Okay, so let's say I have this array right here. And I would like to order it in an ascending way. Even though we have duplicates, still this won't affect our sorting. So, let's define a variable and call it sort maybe. And it's going to equal to mp.sort. And just pass it the array that you want to sort. Now, I just want to print it. Now if I hit on run. You'll see that now my array is sorted in an ascending way. That was really easy, right? Now, let's say I want to order this in a descending way. Well, there is multiple ways to do that, but I'm going to teach you a trick to use this same method in order to order them in a descending way. So all we need to do is, let's say, sort is equal to minus np.sort. Then here I will pass minus array. So, first, I am multiplying all of these by a minus sign inside here, okay? Then it will be sorted. Now, since I have converted all of them to a minus, well, and I sorted them, they will be sorted in 
and descending way, right? Let's try it. First, let me remove this minus and just try to sort them when they are multiplied by a minus sign. Let me print it. We forgot to print. You'll see here actually that they are ordered already in a descending way, but they are in minus, right? Now, all I need to do is just multiply by minus one more time after they are sorted. So now, now you will see that I got the array sorted in a descending way. See, it's a really simple trick. You just convert all your array to a minus, you multiply it by a minus one, then you sort it, then you multiply it again by a minus one so that you can negate the first minus one you have multiplied in the first time. And that's it. This is how you can sort in an ascending and descending way using NumPy. All right, we are still learning the methods of NumPy. Now we are going to learn how can we merge two arrays together. Let's say you have two arrays and you would like to put them in one single array. This is a very common application. The way to do that is by using a method called concatenate. Now to concatenate two arrays, all you need to do is just define, let's say, a new array. Let's call it C. Then just say mp dot concatenate and you just pass it which two arrays you would like to concatenate but you need to pass them as lists okay it's really important so you'd say here a and b in my case now if i try to print c you'll see that the second array was concatenated with the first array as you can see right here now, let's say you would like to do it the other way around. You would like to concatenate the first array to the second array. So this would be B, this would be A, and as you can see, this happened. We concatenated the first one to the second one. Now, please don't forget to pass them as list, okay? Because if you try to do this, you'll get an error, okay? Always concatenate, it will always only accept a list of arrays. Now I can concatenate more arrays with here. Let's say this is D and let's say I have different values like that. And we can just simply say, hey, add C to this. Oh, sorry, not C, it's D. Let's say we wanna add D to this. Now if I run, you'll see that I have all the arrays concatenated into one array. Okay, now we are going to talk about splitting an array to equal parts. Let's say you have data and you would like to split it into multiple parts for your algorithm. Now, in machine learning especially, it's really important sometimes to divide your data set into equal sets and then pass them one by one or split them into training sets and testing sets, which we will be talking about later. But for now, let's say that you have this very, very simple list and you would like to split it into two equal lists, okay? The way to do that is by defining a variable, let's call it splitting, and we need to say mp.hsplit, now you pass which array do you want to split, our array is called a, and to how many parts do you would like to split it, in my case, two. Now if I print splitting, You'll see that I got two arrays with equal length, right? So here I have 5212, so 5212, and this next one is 1792, 1792, and they are two different arrays right now. Here I can print, let's say, splitting zero, the first array I have split it, and the second one. So if I do that, you'll see that now I have two arrays. This is the first one with index zero. And this is the second one with index one. Now, splitting is tricky because if you try to split this to three parts, you would get an error because here you have eight elements and you cannot really divide eight by three into three equal parts, right? You need to make sure that your array is splittable to equal parts first. Okay, let me add one more element here and now try again. And I'm gonna print the third one that will be emerging here. Okay, so now if I hit on the run, you'll see that I have three arrays 
with an equal length and they are all stored in this splitting array okay so split is very important in order to divide your data sets and manipulate them as the application requires all right so far we have learned how we can create arrays from numpy using ranges or using all zeros or using an array that contains all ones but what if i want to create an array with randomized number this is also very important in data science because Sometimes you would like to create arrays that have no random numbers, okay? Or maybe initialize a certain array that you will be using in your algorithm with randomized numbers. So, how can we do that? The NumPy library provides us with the random module. So, we can say here from numpy.random import default underscore random number generator okay I have a typo import okay so this default random number generator is going to be the one that will generate all of these numbers for me so i'm going to create a variable that is called random array okay and take a look how we can generate random numbers here first we need to call random then we would pass it the default rng method okay like that then we need to specify what is the range of my random number so i'm going to say here integers i would like to generate integers from 0 to 100 so we just pass 100 for the range from 0 to 100 and then i would like to specify what is the size of my array that i would like to generate okay so in my case, I would like a one-dimensional array only, and this array, let's say it contains 20 numbers, okay? And here we're still having an error because we have forgot to say that this NP, this random is coming from NumPy. Let's see why we still have errors. Yes, because here it's saying there is no size. We need to say size is equal to, okay? Now we're good. So we are calling this random, number generator from our numpy then you are specifying my array would be integers only and the range will be from 0 to 100 and then i am saying hey i would like a one dimensional array with 20 elements now if i just print this random array you'll see that i got 20 numbers all within the range between 0 and 100 let's limit this to 5 so this is from 0 to 5. So it's actually here saying 5 elements, meaning from 0 to 4, all right? So it's always the max number minus 1, as we have learned actually before. So now we are generating numbers between 0 and 4. And as you can see here, we generated 20 numbers right here between 0 and 4. Now let's say that I would like to have a two-dimensional array very simple i just need to change the dimension right here to two then i would get this is the first dimension and this is the second dimension i could put any dimension i want i could put any number of elements i would like to have in every dimension and any range that i would like to have let's say from zero to nine as you can see here i got one two three four five dimensions and every dimension is initialized with values between 0 and 9. Okay. All right. Right now, we are going to talk about reshaping an array. Let's say you have an array that has six elements like that, and you would like to change it to two-dimensional arrays, and every dimension would contain three elements. Okay. How can you do that? Or the question is, why would you do that? There is a lot of applications for reshaping. Sometimes you have two different arrays, one of them coming from a library, and one of them is something you have created, and you would like to make them compatible with each other in order to do some operations on them. Well, 
in order to make them compatible with each other, they need to have the same shape so that maybe you can relate elements to each other or to any application that you would need. So, especially in data science, you would see that reshaping is actually very important. But this is why I'm just going to give you a small example on reshaping. So let's say you have this array right here and you would like to change it to a two-dimensional array and every dimension would contain three elements. All you need to do is just say a new array, let's call it B, is equal to array dot reshape and then just put your dimensions. So I would like it to be two by three. Okay, two dimensions, every dimension has three elements. Now, if I print this B, you'll see that now it is a two-dimensional array. Each had three elements. So far, so good. Okay, let's make it four-dimensional and every dimension has two elements. You would see that this is not possible. Well, because all I have is actually six elements and I am trying to make it a four by two. Well, I cannot really divide this six by four, right? The number of elements here need to be divisible by the dimension I am giving. So if I extend this to seven, then eight, now I click on run, you'll see that now I have four dimensional array with two elements in every dimension. So when you're reshaping, you need to make sure that the shape is also consistent with the original dimension and shape you have, right? Otherwise, you will get this error and it will say cannot reshape the array for this certain reason. I'm sure that you've seen all of those cool image and video processing apps like Photoshop or maybe your regular mobile phone photo editor. Well, all of their functions is based on what I am about to teach you right now in these upcoming couple of sections. We will learn how to use Python to edit photos and videos and then export them. We will use a library that is called OpenCV, which is the most famous library out there for image and video processing. This library is not only supported by Python, you will see it in Java and C++. And since it is supported in Java, this means that most of your Android apps that uses image processing is using a chunk of this OpenCV library for sure. So it's a really important library to learn. I'm really excited to start this section with you guys, so let's get started. And we are ready to start a new section here. And this section is called OpenCV Library. This is the most famous library for image processing. If we have any image that we would like to read and process in Python, this is the to go library that we use. And we are going to cover a lot of stuff. We will be covering how to read and write images. We will be covering contour extraction, which is a very, very important topic, which means that if we have an image like this and we have some object, we will be able to actually the algorithm here will be able to identify where is this object and make a contour around it like that. Then we can crop it and do whatever we want with this object. This is very important for object detection and then object recognition. We are also going to learn how we can convert images to arrays because an image is actually nothing but an array of values. 1, 2, 17, three all of these are just values now even if we have an rgb image like that every channel or gmb would have their own matrices so the the green here would have its values the blue here would have its values so any rgb image meaning red green blue image it has these three layers which are nothing but arrays now there is also another type of images, which are grayscale images, which consist of only one channel. Okay, no R, no G, no B, just one channel, and every pixel can have a value between 0 and 255. Okay, so this is how we got white and black images. And in most processing, we would like to process these gray images. Uh, scale images because they give us the most information of course after we do some pre-processing to extract if there is something important 
in the colors themselves. We are also going to learn how we can do operations on images, like how can we maybe flip them, okay? Or how can we invert their colors? And this would be really important when we are working with image detection and image classification. We would like to pre-process the image data set that we have, which we will be talking about extensively when we go to the deep learning and to the AI sections. And we also need to learn how we can process video. A video is nothing but a chain of images. So we have image one, two, three, and if we play them back at a certain rate, we would get a motion. So let's say the point was here, next frame point was here, next frame point was here. So if we play this fast, we would see the point moving like that. And we will learn how we can process video and we will learn how we can do object tracking in videos. Meaning that if we have a video, we would like to be able to track an object in that video and see where it is going. Okay, so we have a lot of exciting topics to cover. Let's dig into it. Now, before we go any further in OpenCV, I would like to introduce you to some color theory. Now, why is color theory important? Because any image you see is actually consists of colors. Now, when we talk about what we call a grayscale image, this is the simplest type of images, actually because it only consists of only one color space, which is the gray color space. This gray color space starts with a value of 0 and it ends with 255. 0 corresponds to black. Imagine that you have a pixel here, right? Your screen consists of millions of pixels. And this pixel, when you give it a value of 0, it turns off. Now, when you give it a value of 255, it's going to illuminate all the way to the max, giving you the illusion that this color is white. Now, all the colors in between this space right here is going to be shades of gray. So, do you know those old TVs? Those old TVs work on this color space, which is the gray scale. It consists only of colors like black and white and all the shades in between them, which are gray shades. We can demonstrate this simply by going to paint. Now we can demonstrate this easily here. Take a look at this. We are scanning all the colors from white all the way to black. This is the color space we have when we talk about grayscale images. Now let's move into color images. Any image that we have and we see, let's say here we have an image that consists of multiple colors. It could be an image of anything actually, but it is a colored image. A colored image actually consists of three layers. The first layer is actually the R, meaning the red. Then we have the G, which is the green. And then we have the B, which is the blue. Any colored image you see consists of those three channels. When we combine them together, we get this colored image and we can get any color that we want using only R, G, and B space. So this space is only one dimensional and this space is actually three dimensional. Now let us demonstrate this. Now if we go back to paint, take a look here or red, green, blue. Any color consists of these three combinations. Let's say when we talk about green, you'll see that the green value is the highest and there's a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. If I am to give red zero and blue the value of zero, you'll see that I got a pure green. Now, if I say red is 255, green is zero and blue is zero, I will get a pure red. Now, as we go to the shades of red, we'll see that more colors like green and blue are going to get into this equation, giving you this illusion of shades. See that? Now, let's go to yellow. We'll see that yellow is consisting mainly of a lot of red and a lot of green and a little bit of blue. This is what yellow is. If we go to white, 
we will see that to form a white in three channels, we need to pass 255 for red, same thing for green, and same thing for blue, meaning that we give the maximum value for red, green, blue, and we get white. Now, what happens if I give the minimal value for red, green, blue? We will get the black color. And what we described here is called the RGB space. There is multiple color spaces. We have the lab space, we have the HSV space. Each one deals with colors in a different way. But this is for the RGB space. In the previous lecture, we have covered the RGB space. Now what I would like to talk about is the HSV space. Now the HSV space consists of three channels as well, and they are called the hue, saturation, and value. If you work with Photoshop, or actually with any photo editor, you'll see that you can change the colors of an image either using RGB or HSV. Let's take a look. The hue is the one that will be spanning the whole color space. Let's try to simulate it. You'll see that the hue is the one that determines what is the color. Is it like reddish? Is it orange? Is it green? Is it bluish? Is it purple? So the hue is going to scan which color you want. Now let's say that we chose the color the saturation, take a look here at the saturation. Take a look at this bar right here and at this line right here. What do you notice? The saturation is actually, after you have picked the color in hue, now you choose how saturated it is, meaning how reddish it is if the color is red. As you can see, the higher the saturation, the more red the color will be. Take a look here. We are moving between red and white right now by changing the saturation. Let's choose a different color. Let's say maybe this blue. If I move it, take a look at this ball here. It is moving between white and blue. So the saturation chooses the shade of the color you want. Now, how about value? If we already picked up the color and the shade, what's left? What's left is the value or the illuminance of that color. Take a look at this bar right now. You'll see that it is dimming down or lighting up. So this is like the lighting of this color. As you can see, the more value, the more bright the color will get. The less the value, the more dark the color will get until we reach black. Now you might ask, why do we need multiple spaces? Away from the photo editing capabilities, like changing the hue and the saturation, maybe will give you better looking colors. In some image processing applications, it's really important, for example, to try to separate the lighting. So let's say that you are doing some image classification of a ball, and you have multiple images of a ball being outside in the sun and being inside in a not really well illuminated room. You should be able to identify that this is a ball regardless of how bright the environment is. This is why analyzing such a problem with HSV will be much easier than RGB because you can always separate until some degree the brightness of the environment from this V channel right here. And this is HSV. Now that we have an idea on what is OpenCV and what we are going to do with it, let's see how we can download it. There is two OpenCV libraries. One of them is the official OpenCV, and then there is the contribution OpenCV. Contribution OpenCV contains more functions like the one we use for object tracking. So we will be installing that. All we need to do is open Anaconda prompt and say pip install OpenCV contrib dash Python. Run it and we should be good to go. And then we will be starting implementing some OpenCV code. And we are ready to start OpenCV. First thing we need to do is just say import CV2. You don't say OpenCV, 
you say CV2. Now, there is two versions of OpenCV. One of them is CV1 and CV2. And, well, if you are reading some documentation and you see CV in the function, all you need to do is just add this 2 to it because, well, CV is not something we are using right here. Now, I have placed an image in this directory. So, in this same file directory, I have some image. If you not sure if you are in the right directory with spider, you can click on this folder here and just go to the directory that it contains the script and the images. Make sure that the script and the images are in the same directory. Okay, this is how to read an image and how to write it back. Okay, so reading and writing. I'm going to say image is equal to cv2.imread and then just pass the name of the image as long as you are in the same directory okay now if we run this we run it no problem now how about we write it back let's write this image with a different name so i'm going to say he say here cv2.image write and then we will give the name of the image let's say new logo.png make sure to add the extension as well and then what variable image do we have since we have read the image, now the image in, is inside this variable. Now we can write this variable again with a different name and we would get the image again. So let's run this. Let's go and check the directory. And now you see that we have the same image well, but with a different name. So far so good. Let's continue. Let's say that I would like to display the image in a separate window. Now, as you can see, we are working with spider with images, okay? That's okay, you can work with Jupyter Notebook, but I like to show you both environments all the time. So, I'm going to be saying cv2.imageShow or imShow. Then, what is the title of the window that we will open? Let's say logo window, you can name it whatever you want. And then, what do you want to display? I would like to display this variable which contains an image. Now, this is not enough. If you run it right now, you won't be able to exit the image until you break the whole program. So what you need to do is say cv2.wait key. You will wait a certain action here. And then when this action happens, you need to destroy the window so that you can close it. So I'm going to say destroy all window. Now, if I hit on run, you'll see that I got a window containing the image. That's really cool. Now, if I close it, no problem, it will close without any issues and the program will terminate correctly. Now, let us see how we can convert an image into a grayscale. Now we have two ways to do that. We can do that while we are reading the image or we can do that in a separate function. Sometimes we get images from datasets that we download from the internet, so we don't have the luxury of reading it from directory. We would be having it directly in a variable. If we have it in a variable, how can we convert it to grayscale? We need another method, right? Let's start with the first method. Here we are reading an image. This logo is in our directory. We have talked about this. Now we need just to add a simple parameter here. We will say cv2 image read or im read then gray scale as simple as that now if i try to run this you'll see that i have the image as gray scale if i remove this you'll see that i will be reading it as a colored image or an rgb image okay now this is the first method i'm going to comment this out copy this and delete this so that we can keep this line what is the next method? The next method can be done by calling a method called CVT color. How can we do that? Let's create a new variable called gray image. And then we will say cv2.cvt color. We pass it the image that we would like to convert to grayscale. And then we specify the following. We say cv2.color bgr2 gray. Now, OpenCV does not read the colors as RGB, it reads it as BGR. So the first channel is B, then G, then R. Other libraries like Bill, for example, which also is famous, will read the image as RGB. Okay, you need to put this into consideration because sometimes if you are reading from Bill and loading using OpenCV, you could get an inverted color image because of these channels not being in the same order. 
but anyway let's convert this from bgr which we have read from here as a colored bgr image to gray and then we would like to copy this paste it here and run and now it's gray again okay so we have two methods you can choose in between So far, we learned how to read an image and convert it to grayscale using two ways and then display it. Now, what I want to teach you is how can we binarize an image. Sometimes we would like to mask only the object that we have in an image. So if I display this right now, you'll see that we have gray colors and here white colors. How about we convert all the objects in this image into white? and the background we keep it black. Binarization is very important process when we are pre-processing images for contour extractions in order to apply it for maybe object detection to know where is the object or even for object classification when we do some masking, which we will learn later on in this course. Okay, so how can we do binarization? We need to apply something called a threshold. Let's add two variables here. One of them is called return and then a threshold. Okay, and then we will be calling a function or a method called threshold. Which image would we like to threshold? It's the gray image, right? We would like to binarize it and convert all the logo to white. Here it will be passing 0 and 255. I will explain this in a minute. Then we need to pass the parameter cv 23 binary. Now, what does this say? It says that all the values that are equaling zero or less in my image, which mean all my background, because black is actually corresponding to zero and uh, 255 corresponding to white. Okay, so all of these values that are zero, please keep them zero, meaning keep the background as it is. Now, what I'm saying here is any pixel that the condition here does not apply, meaning anything but background, just turn it to white. Okay. It is as simple as that. Now, if I try to show you guys this threshold, we will be getting the logo in white and the background in black. That is exactly what binarization is. Now, let me show you what was the values before and after binarization. To do that, we will be using the numpy unique function. So we need to say import numpy as np. And here we will be saying a gray numpy is equal to np dot array gray image so we need to first convert the image into a numpy array then we can call print np dot unique on this gray np okay now we will be doing the same thing for threshold we will be converting it again to numpy array and then just print the unique values. Let's execute this. Now take a look here. This is the first execution. Since we have a gray scale, we have multiple values ranging between 0 and 255. And we've seen that because we had a gray image when we were using this PGR to gray. A gray is all the shades in the range between 0 and 255. Now, after we binarize it, we only have two values, 0 and 255. See, this is exactly what we have done. We made the whole image containing only two values or binary values. Okay, let's learn a small trick on how can we rotate an image. Image rotation is very important when we are training some uh, deep learning models because we would like, there is something called image augmentation and we would like to create multiple copies of that image, each in a different rotation angle, okay? Also, we can use rotation when we are trying to process an image and just rotating it. It's like when you take a picture with your mobile phone and then you would like to rotate the image in the editor. This is the function that is used. Let's see how we can do it. I'm gonna call this rot for rotation. Then I'm gonna call cv2.rotate. I'm going to be passing the image, then just say cv2 dot capital letter rotate underscore 90 degrees and then clockwise. Now, if I run this, we will be getting this image, but here we need to pass rotate instead. So let's pass rotate. And the image is rotated. We can also rotate this 180 degrees like that. As you can see, now it's upside down. 
or we can even rotate it counterclockwise, so in the other direction. So this is all about rotation. It's really a simple function. In some cases, we might have some numby arrays that we would like to convert to OpenCV. Or in some other cases, we would have artificial data images that are generated by NumPy array, and then we would like to further process it by OpenCV. And now we are going to learn how we can do that. We will be learning how to generate artificial images. Could be any image, doesn't really matter. And we will see how we can convert it into a format that NumPy, that OpenCV can really process. I'm going to be importing the following from numpy.random import default underscore random number generator okay because we will be generating some random data i'm going to create an image generated by numpy so i'm going to say np.random underscore default underscore rng we have learned about random number generators in the beginner introduction to uh, python in the first few modules now we will be passing integers to and the size of this image will be 200 by 200 and this image will have a type d type is equal to mp dot unsigned integer 8 bit okay so i'm generating an image that is an 8 bit image size 200 by 200 using numpy now if i try to display this image it will give me an image like that okay but this is a black image so let's process it a little bit further we are going to say image is equal to mb.array and then we will say image multiplied by 255 and then we will be running this again. And as you can see now, we are getting a noise image that looks like those old TVs with antennas and that's really good. We are now able to create an array of random values and just display it using OpenCV. Now, it's really important to pass this parameter because without it, we will be getting this error. It's really, really important that you specify what is the type of the image you are generating. If you don't have the luxury of generating the image randomly and maybe you are getting the image from some numby array from somewhere that is you did not generate yourself then this parameter won't be here you can just simply convert this to a numby array and just pass it a type so if you have a random numby array that you would like to convert into something that opencv can deal with just get this numby array put it in a casting np.array and then just give it a type then you can use it directly with OpenCV. So whenever you see this error right here, CV32S or similar ones, it means that your NumPy array does not have a type that your OpenCV can work with. Let us talk about how can we generate images and stack them together horizontally or vertically. Now, sometimes this is important if we would like to compare two images next to each other. So let's see what is the NumPy technique to do that. While learning that, we will be learning also how can we generate an image that is totally white and another image that is totally black. Let's create image number one and it will be using NumPy and we will be using the method called zero. Now zeros will create an array with a certain size which we will provide let's say 40 by 40 pixels well let's specify that it is np unsigned integer 8 so that opencv can process it and well let us display it as we can see we got this small black image okay how can we create a white image since numpy zeros is going to create an array all filled with zeros corresponding to the color black, let's see how can we create something with a custom value. Well, because the value of white is 255. Let's see what can we do. Image2 is equal to numpy.full. Now, full is a method that we can use to create an array filled with a certain value. So here it will be 40 by 40 and let's say that it is filled with 255 and of course mp dot and site integer 8. let's remove this n okay now let's display image 2 and this is image 2 and it is a white image 
Now we can also use this one to create a black image. So we can substitute this zeros with full as well by just passing zero here instead of the 255 corresponding to white. So if we run this, it's a black right now. As you can see, we have two methods, and I just wanted to show you how you can implement both methods. Black and white images are very important to create backgrounds or if we are doing some masking. So these kind of black and white images are pretty important when it comes to image processing. So now let's stack two images on top of each other. I'm going to create a variable called stack vertical. And the method is a numpy method that will be doing the stacking. And it's called vStack, short for vertical stack. It will accept multiple arrays and we pass them as a tuple. So we open a parenthesis and just put our images in. Okay, now let us display that but before we can display it we would like to convert it to this unsigned integer we cannot really pass this into the vertical stack so what we're going to do is we are going to cast it just the usual way we say mp.array we pass stack ver just pass mp.u integer for unsigned integer and a okay now if we run this we will see that we have two pictures stacked on top of each other now, maybe let's change this picture to white. And that's good. We have them both now. We can stack as many pictures as we want. Let's stack another one. Let's call it image 3 and just pass here image 3. And as you can see, now we have three pictures stacked on top of each other. Okay, now there's another method to stack all of these horizontally. So we're going to say stack hor is equal to mp.h stack. And I'm just going to copy these. And I'm going to display this stack horizontal. So the only difference is this is H stack and this is V stack. Now, if we display this, we will see that all the pictures are stacked horizontally. Well, that's good. What I would like to explain now is something called contour extraction. And this is a very, very important topic in image processing. Let's say that I have an image, doesn't matter the size, and this image contains multiple shapes. Or let's start with one shape, one simple shape, a circle. And this is a filled, colored circle. Okay? Let's take the classification problem. Classification problem is to be able to identify objects in an image then being able to tell that this object is a ball this object is a lamp this object uh, is a mouse a keyboard doesn't really matter the point is to identify what is in this image okay now the first step to do that is to actually be able to locate where is the objects themselves let's say that we are able to locate that our object is here now let's say that we have located our object and it is right here. How can we extract it? The extraction is called contour extraction here. Contour is this area that is surrounding the object. So it is the boundary of the object. If I can't find the boundary of the object, then I have found the object. Then I can take these boundaries and then pass them to a classifier. Now let's say that this image contains more shape like a triangle a square now i would like to be able to extract the boundaries of every object i have now these boundaries will be stored in a list that contains all the coordinates of these okay so you can imagine it as containing small lists of x's and y's for every single contour that i have that means i will be having a large list like this for every object i have I have three objects and they contain all the x y now this is the big picture but how can we achieve this we need to do some pre-processing to be able to eliminate the background and focus only on the objects okay let me give you another example let's say that this image here has this background which is a black background okay 
I would like to be able to create a very high contrast between the object and the background. What do I mean by contrast? Well, if this object somehow is colored white, every single object, then this contrast between the background and the object is really large. Why? Because there is a huge difference between 0 being the color black and 255 which is the color white. So this huge difference between the color spectrum, we call it contrast. The more the contrast, the easier I will be able to tell that this is an object and this is a background. My goal would be to pre-process this image so that I have the objects in white and the background in black. Okay, this is why we have binarization. Do you remember we have talked about binarization? Binarization is to choose a threshold, if that is applicable, in order to make the image look like black and white. Okay, now there is tons of research, tons of algorithms just to solve this problem. But I'm trying to simplify it to you as much as possible so that you can understand why do we need to pre-process the image before we can start extracting contours. Because if the contrast here is not high enough. We let's say that maybe the background here is containing some gray or close to gray. Maybe the contour then is going to be labeled like this. So we will be having a circle here and here some noise coming out of it. And the object will not be contoured correctly. And the classifier then might not work as expected. This is why we would like to define the edges as they are on every object by creating high contrast. All right, now we are going to solve a small exercise in order to be able to extract. All right, let's see how we can extract contours. As I said, the first step is to pre-process the image. We have written this code before while we were learning about image read and gray conversion and thresholding. Well, this is exactly the kind of uh, pre-processing that I would do for a simple image like the logo here. Okay, so if you did not watch this video, I recommend you to go back and watch them, but I will briefly explain them. Here we are reading an image. We are converting it into a grayscale. We are converting it then into a NumPy array. Then we are thresholding it by converting all the colors other than black to white. And then we are reconverting this to a NumPy array. And then we are displaying it. Okay. Now, if I run it, you'll see that I have the image like that. Now, let's put the images before and after like we learned in stacking just to be comparing quickly. I'm going to be passing here vStack is equal to mp.vstack and we will be passing the images as a tuple. Which images I would like to pass? Well, I would like to pass the original one and also the threshold one. Now let's convert vstack. So we have vstack is equal to mp.array and then vstack. And here we will be displaying vstack. Let's run this. Yes, it is complaining that all the images need to be the same. Since this is colored and this is not colored, it won't. we won't be able to stack them like that. So maybe we will be displaying the grayscaled one instead of the colored one. And as you can see, after grayscaling, it was like this. And after thresholding, it looked like this. Now we are ready to apply an algorithm on this image here in order to extract the contour. Let's see. Let's go here. And the method we are going to use to extract this is called find contours. We are going to say contour and h. It will return two parameters. We will be concerned only with the contours right now. And we are going to say cv2.findContours. Then which image are we going to process? Well, the threshold image. So this is thresh1. And then we need to pass cv2.re tr underscore cc com then here we need to pass cv2 dot chain approx simple now what's all of this here we are passing the image here we are specifying how we would like to return those contours would we like to have relationships between the contours like we would like to if we have two contours inside each other would i want to say that the outer contour is the parent and the inner one is the child 
So this is related to how would I like to return the contours. For now, I'm not going to be concerned with this parameter. We will just pass it as it is. And here, the method that we would like to apply in order to extract the contours. It's like, what is the algorithm you would like to use in order to extract the contours? So this is the one that we would like to use. This is the standard one. And that's it. Now, if I try to print contours, let me just comment this out a little bit and close this. Let's run it you will see that I got a huge list of coordinates. Now, let us see what is the length of this contour. We will be printing len contours. We will see that the length of these contours is 12. Well, how can we represent them? How can we draw them? We will see how we can do that in a minute. Now, let's talk about how can we draw these contours. There is a function in OpenCV that is called the draw contours. All we need to do is just say cv2 dot draw contours, and we need to pass it the image that we would like to draw on, which is the original image. So we would like to take the original image and draw the contours over it. Next, you need to specify where is the contours, which are right here. So we just pass contours. And here we would pass minus one because we would like to draw all the contours. If I want to draw a specific index in the contours, I might pass zero, one, two, or whatever. But I would like to draw all the contours. So I would be passing minus one. And then the contour, the outline or the border of the object need to have a color, right? Because we are drawing it. Let's draw it with 255, zero, 255. And then the thickness of the line we are drawing. Let's pass one. Now we will be showing the image. Let's remove this. So now let us run this. Now if we take a look, we will see that we have drawn this like that. Let's put them next to each other. Uh, there is my stack. I would like to take the stack, put it here at the end. And I would like to draw the original image. And let us create two versions of this. I know this is not really practical, but I just wanna I just wanna draw them next to each other. So this will be original. Okay. And now I would like to draw image and original next to each other. This is my image and this is my original. Now let's draw V stack. And as you can see, this is the original image, and here we have detected where are the contours of this. See? They are in purple, encapsulating every object we have in here. See, the background here does not have any contours. Only the objects that we are seeing in the image are having contours. Now, let us find a method to crop this text here and every single one of these separately and draw them on a separate image. Because this small exercise is very important. Because when you have a, an image with multiple objects, you would like to be able to crop every individual object and maybe then pass it to a classifier to tell you what is this object exactly, or maybe to crop it and store it as a separate image. So this exercise can be applied to a lot of uh, projects out there. So let's take a look. How can we do that? So far, we were able to contour all of our pieces right here. Now, let us separate them and put every single letter in a separate image. Okay, let's do that. What we would like to do is to crop this contour, fill everything inside it, and just save it on a separate image. But how can we exactly do that? I'm going to be creating a list called image list. All right. Now, this image list will contain all of my separate images. We are going to iterate over our contours. So I'm going to be saying for I, C, and T, enumerate contours. Okay, I'm using enumerate because I need a counter and I want all the contours that are inside this contours variable. Okay, what's next? Let us create empty images. Now, these empty images, we are going to use them in order to crop from the original image one object at a time and then put that crop symbol on the new empty image. How can we create empty images? Remember, I told you that this is an important topic because we use it for such because we use it to solve such a small problem. So we have image is equal to mp dot zeros. 
I would like to have a black images and then draw over them. Now, first, we would like to pass the shape. What is the shape here? Well, the shape will be the same as my original image shape. It's important to have consistent shapes right here. So I'm going to be saying image dot shape zero. And this is, of course, inside the tuple. Then we have image dot shape one. So we have the height and the width of the image passed here. So we don't have to specify them ourselves. We will just go to the image and get the height and the width. This will be the size of my empty image. Next, I would like to specify the type. So it is mp.unsigned integer a. Uh, it's giving us an error here because we did not add in. Okay, now we're good. Let's continue. Now let's draw the contours. We are going to say cv2.draw contours. Where would we like to draw them? I would like, see here, I'm extracting every single contour out of here. Every object we had, I mean the individual letters, the OpenCV symbols, each of them is stored individually in this contour. So I am now extracting them one by one. Okay, I'm going to be drawing on the empty image I created and I am going to be passing the contours one by one. Now, let's pass it like that. I would like to draw all the contours inside the CNT and I would like to draw everything in white. And we would like to pass minus one here because I would like to fill if the contour is closed. Remember, we were reading the outer bound of the contour, right? What I would like to exactly have is that the contour is filled as well. I don't want only the outer bounds, but I want the whole object. So this parameter is used for filling. Now that's it. Since we have around 12 contours, they won't fit if I fit them horizontally or vertically. You can write a function that will display a grid of images instead of only horizontally or vertically. But for the purpose of this lecture, I'm going to be just splitting these contours into two sections. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to say I am to show images to show one is equal to mp.hstack and just pass it the image list as a tuple, of course. Let's say between zero and seven. Okay, and I'm going to be doing the same thing for the second part. I'm just dividing these images into two sections. Here I'm saying I want images between 0 and 6. Even though it's 7, we take it the outer bound minus 1. And here we would like to have the images between 7 and 13, meaning between image number 7 and image 12. So here 13, it means 12. Okay? All right. Now let us show two windows. In order to show two windows, it's important to give them different window title. Okay, so this is 1, this is 2. And here is my one image to show one and image to show two. Okay, now let us see what we are going to be drawing. Oh, okay, we forgot to append as well. So let us append. So we need m list. Right now the list is actually empty. So we need to append, append image. Okay, now let's run it again. And here we go. We have two windows containing all of our letters. We have open, we have O, P, we have the E, we have the N, and we have the symbols, we have the CV, but we also have some noise. As you can see, we have very small symbols over there that are noise. Well, we are going to handle these in the next tutorial, but for now, I wanted to show you what is the difference between passing the contours in a list and without a list. Now, if I don't pass it in a list and I try to just execute, you'll see that I'm not getting the full contour. I'm getting an open contour, a point that are not connected to each other. And since they are not connected to each other, the whole field contours parameter right here won't work as expected. So it's really important that you pass them as a list so that all the points will be included. So here we will return it as a list. Let's close the windows and let's run again. And we're good. Now what's left is to get rid of these small noises. Let's do that. Now how can we filter those small images that we were reading? We will be filtering them by size. 
there is a method in OpenCV that helps us to measure the size of a certain contour area or measure the area of a certain contour. It's very simple actually. All we need to do is just say area is equal to CV2 dot contour area like that and just pass it the contour. Now how about we print all of those areas and I don't want to be showing anything for the moment. As you can see, we have some really large objects and at the same time, we have a very, very small object. How about we get rid of those super small objects? We can set a threshold by just observing these areas right here. Let's set the threshold to 71. Here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to say if area is larger than 71, then I would like to do all of these things. So I'm not going to be appending any images or creating any new images unless the area is larger than 71. Now, if I run this, I'm going to be having problems because the limits here are not correct. How about we set these limits dynamically? So we could say bound one is equal to len of image list. So we get the length of image list and we divide it by two. And then we have here bound one. And here we would be having bound one right and what about this higher bound well bound two would be just the length of this plus one so this will be my bound two okay so we divided this list into two sections we added the bounds and we got the length of the whole list we have whole list of images we have uh, extracted and this is my bound two okay now let us run this and also we need this to be an integer okay so it's important to be an integer and we're good. Now let us start showing the images that we have cropped. And here are my images. It seems that we have cropped more letters than we need. So let us decrease this threshold to 26. Okay, so it seems that 71 is a letter. So let's decrease it to 26 and try again. Here we have open and we have the CV. It seems that we still have a little bit of noise because we have four letters for open and CV, but here we have five letters. That's totally okay. Now that we got rid, let us start the masking operation in order to crop the actual symbol and not the black and white one. All right, what I want to explain now is masking. Let's see what is this concept all about. Let's say that you have an image. And again, I'm going to be taking a very simplified object in it, like a, just a square. Now what we have done so far is taking this image and then drawing it like that. And then using contour detection to get the image to look like this, right? So we got just a white square. Now, how can we get back and just crop the original image, right? Because yes, we used contour detection. Yes, we have created this contour around it and we filled it. So now we have something that we call a mask. Because why do I call it a mask? Because if I take these two images and just put them on top of each other, the squares here are going to be matching each other, right? So this is a mask and this is my original, right? If I put them on top of each other, this square will match this square. Now, that is the whole point of this operation. Let me jump to something else for a moment. There is something called the AND logical operation. And how, what does this operation do is that if you have two bits, it's going to calculate the AND bitwise operation of that. What do I mean by this? Let's say I put zero as the first input and zero as the second input. The result here will be zero so this is a and this is b if my first input is zero and my second input is one i still would get a zero if this is one and this is zero i would still get a zero only if both of them are one i would get a one so this is the and bitwise operation and it says that only if a and b are one then the output should be one Okay, now what does this have to do with masking? This is what masking is about. This is one technique of masking. Let's say that we have an image that looks like this. And here, we, this image is three by three. Okay, and there is only 
one box that is filled here okay so this box has a value maybe of 255 okay now let's say this box have some value doesn't matter what it is let's say 21 this box has a value of 23 this is 107 2 3 0 251 125 doesn't really matter this is my original image now let's say that we used contour detection blah 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 and now we have a mask and this mask is only the middle box okay so this mask is also an array it is the same thing and it has values here here we have one or 255 or whatever and here all of those are zeros remember that we were cropping the object and we were putting it on a black image with all zeros now how about we take the end operation of these two images okay the result is going to be every pixel will be and with the corresponding pixels because this original and mask have the same size this is also three by three if we put them on top of each other every pixel will be and with its corresponding pixel so this one is zero anything ending with zero will end up being a zero right so let's put a result matrix here so now this pixel with this pixel we're going to get zero everywhere where it is zero we will be getting zero so it's all around here is zero now if we add these two numbers together we are going to get the original number here which is let's be it 255 so what did we do now this image that we have we have cancelled everything around it and we got only the one that we have masked using this mask it means that we got back to the original image it means that we only have now this symbol right here we don't have the white image anymore we have the original image and we cropped only what the mask wants us to crop this is how if we have an image with multiple objects we create a mask for every object then we use bitwise and by using that we would get images of the separate object it's this is not a mask anymore this is not a mask this is the original image let's see how we can implement that now that we have explained the intuition behind masking let's implement it i'm going to create a new list called masked images okay this is the images after masking and here i'm going to be calling a variable masked is equal to cv2 dot we will be using the method called bitwise underscore and this is an OpenCV method. You just need to specify. Since here we have only one source, we need to pass image one more time. And then we need to specify the mask. So here we have mask is equal to IM, right? Because here it's the black and white image is the mask. And I am masking it with the original image. Now I can extract every single letter and the symbols. Next, let me append this. So I'm going to say masked img.append masked okay now let us pass masked instead of image list masked image and here as well let's run this and as we can see now we have separated everything now each one is a separate image except for this small noise that we have here well we got all of our images now it's really not unusual to get noise and usually let's say if we are passing this to a classifier to classify something in the classifier we would have a label for noise where we can throw away all the things that don't matter so we don't really have to process everything 100 percent in opencv usually we use after algorithms in order to do that but so far the results are pretty good this is exactly what we are looking for we can additionally if we want to save the images separately well we can just say here cv2 dot image right 
just specify the name let's say letter plus let's convert i to string so that we don't override the images with the same name this is i plus dot gpg and then let's pass the masked let us comment this out let's see if we can write these images directly or do we need something else and we got no error so let's see those images now if we take a look here we have those as separate images we have decomposed this image we have here that's great what i would like to talk about right now is video processing and video processing is really similar to image processing but well it has more things going on in it now if you think about it a video that is playing multiple frames is nothing but multiple pictures that are stacked together and, and are played at a certain rate okay now your standard mobile phone can take videos let's say at 30 fps meaning 30 frames per second it means that every picture here we call it a frame it's just an image it means that every one second we are playing 30 of those images this is image starting one and this is image 30 and this will be spanning for one second so if we would like to process a video we have to process every individual image now some phones can maybe record in 60 fps and some advanced cameras can go up to one can go to 1000 fps it means that we pass 1000 images per second this is and this is the essence of slow motion slow motion is a lot of images being played within a very short amount of time so that you can capture the movement in details and you get no blurring when you're doing that now let's see how we can process a video using OpenCV. Now let's see how we can read a video using OpenCV because the first step in order to process it is to actually read this video. I have here a very simple video. It's just this logo we were processing and it is moving to the right and just moving back to the left. Okay, so we want something simple to start with. How can we read this video? We need to import OpenCV first. Then let's add the path to this video. Let's say that the video is in the same directory as our Python script. Okay. And let's just put the name of the video. It's called logomotion.mp4. Now we need to create an instance of this capturing or this video. So we need to say cap is equal to cv2.video capture. And we need to specify where is the path. Now, we will be creating a while loop or an infinite loop because, well, we need to read all the frames, right? So this is why we need a loop. We will say while cap dot is opened, meaning that as long as this video is opened by our program, we are going to continue looping through this video and extract the frames. So is opened is actually a method for OpenCV and it is used to make sure that as long as the video is open we can do some stuff. Now we need two variables. One of them is called red and the other is called frame. We will explain these variables in a second. This will equal to cap dot read. Now here is what's going to happen. Read is going to return the frames. Remember the images we've talked about that the video is a chain of images. We will be reading these frames one by one, storing them in the frame in every while loop. And this ret is going to return true as long as we have frame. Now, when we reach the end of the video and we try to read a frame, we have nothing else to read, right? Because we don't have any frames because the video has reached its end. So this ret will return false to us the moment we have no more frames to read and it's a very important indicator because we're going to use it right now we are going to say if ret meaning as long as ret is true and as long as we have a frames i would like to show those frames or images i'm just going to use image show i'm going to call the window frame and i'm going to be showing the frames or the images one by one in every single loop 
Now, once we reach the end of the video, what are we going to do? I want to break out of this loop. Okay. Once we are done and we broke out of the loop, we need to release the cap. Remember here, we have opened the file and we were executing this as long as, as it's open. Now we need to close things after we are done. We need to say cap release, meaning that don't hold the capturing anymore, just release it so that this is, does not hold anymore. This condition will not hold anymore if we try to rerun the program a second time. Now we need to destroy the windows. So we need to say destroy all windows so that we don't get stuck because here we are showing an image and as we are showing normal images and we were just waiting for a key and destroying the window, we need to do the same thing for videos as well. And by talking about wait key, we also need to wait for the key here. So we will say cv2 dot wait key one okay now let's play this and it is playing all right so this is how we read a video let's see if we can apply the techniques we have learned in image processing into video processing i mean since here we are decomposing the video into a series of images maybe we can take every image and just process it as we are processing a regular image Let's try to convert this video into a black and white video. So we will have frame is equal to cv2.cvt color. Then we have the frame. Then here we have cv2.color underscore pgr2 gray. Okay, let's see if this will make any difference. If I run it, as we can see now, it's black and white and it is moving. Now, how about we rotate this video? We have learned about rotation as well. We can say here frame is equal to cv2 dot rotate. Then we will be passing the frame and the parameter. Let us flip this clockwise. So here we will have rotate underscore 90 underscore clockwise. Now let's see what's going to happen. As you can see, we have rotated this 90 degrees. Well, let's comment out this rotate and maybe flip it. Now, there is a function for flipping as well. Sometimes when we take a video using our camera, the video just comes out flipped. And sometimes we really don't like that and we would like to flip it back. The way to do this is very simple. All we need to do is just say cv2.flip pass what you want to flip which is the frame and here you have multiple options you have zero meaning x axis of flipping if we pass one this would be a flip on the y axis and if we pass minus one it means x and y flip at the same time okay so here let us flip this around the y axis let's pass one and see what's going to happen as you can see, it is a flipped around the y-axis. Now, let's try zero. Now it's a flipped around the x-axis. If we try minus one, we will be flipping it in all directions. That's really great. So this is how we can process a simple video. So right now, let's explain how can we change brightness saturation and also the hue of our image now we have talked about hsv color space before which is a hue saturation and value now let's see what kind of algorithm would we like to apply in order to do that let's say that we have an image and well let's assume that we converted this image into hsv okay so this is my h this is my s and this is my v and this is all my image it's the same image okay when we convert from one color space to the other we would be getting an image for every channel and that makes our job easy let's say i would like to change the hue which means i want to shift the colors of all the image well now here i will be having values for the hue 
and these values are between 0 and 255. This goes the same for saturation and value. They have this range. Let's say that the value here is 120, here it is 5, here it is 150, here it is 12, 71, and maybe 91. Okay? Now, if I want to change the hue, all I need to do is to go and add a hue value to this array. And then we recombine all of these arrays together and we get a new modified hue picture. Okay? But how can we do that? Let's say that I would like to increase the hue by uh, something like 100. Let's say that I would like to increase the hue by a value of 200. Okay? I just want to increase it to the maximum. If I try and add 200 to all of these values, I would have an issue because here, by then, I would get values here that are higher than 255. And that's something that I really don't want. What can we do to resolve this issue? Well, we would create a variable, let's call it limit, and this limit will be 255 minus whatever value I have. So this is my value, and then we will do the following, okay? We will have limit equals 255 minus value. Now, this is the limit. This will equal to 55. Now, if I go and add 55 to any of those, I won't have any issues, right? Now, what is this indicator? This will give me an idea on the pixels that would be out of range if I added this 200. Remember, my goal is to add 200. Take a look here. This is an indicator that any value in this matrix that is larger than 55 is going to give me an issue when I add this 200. Let's try. 120, is it larger than 55? Yes. If I add 200 to it, it would be 320. So yes, the indicator here works. Let's take this value. Is it larger than 55? No. So it won't make a problem if I add 200 to it, right? Because 200 plus 12 is 212. Same thing for the 5. Now the 71. Is 71 larger than 55? Yes. It means that if I add 200 to it, I would be out of range. Because I would be getting 271, which is larger. Right? 91 is the same and 150 is the same. So what would I do next is, I would come here and say, update all the values in this matrix that are larger than 55 and just give it a 255 right because we are going out of range it only makes sense that we assign it the largest value so my array right now would look something like this this is my h array this value will be 255 automatically this will stay 12 this will this one will stay 5 this will be 255, 255, and here 255, okay? But what about these values? What are we going to do with them? Well, here comes the next part of the algorithm. We are going to say increment all values in the matrix that are less or equal to 55. Increment it by value. What is value? It's 200. So I'm going to come here, and this will be my next part of the algorithm. It's going to stay 255. This one is less than 55, so I'm going to add to it the value that I want to assign, which is 200. So this will be 212. This is going to be 205. These will stay intact. You can apply the same thing for saturation and for value. This is how we modify images and change their HSV values, which we can see in any photo editor, be it on your phone or be it Photoshop, be it anything. This is how it is done. Now, let's say that you did not change this to HSV, you changed it to RGB. You see some editors give you the ability to change one of these values. It's the same thing we would be decomposing the image into RGB, and then we would be applying the same algorithm for the R and G and B channels. Okay, now let us code this function that will change the HSV values. I'm going to create a new function here because it will be easier to work with the frames like this. 
and I'm gonna call it HSV change. Okay, it will receive the frame and it will return the frame. Now it will also here receive the value that I would like to add or subtract from here. Let's first create the variable limit that we have talked about. This limit is going to equal to 255 minus this value. Next, let us convert this frame that we have into HSV, right? This is the most important step here. We are going to call this HSV frame is equal to cv2.cvt color and then let's pass the frame and cv2.color underscore bgr to hsv so we are taking the rgb value or the bgr value and converting it into hsv now let's split this so we have hsv is equal to cv2.split hsv frame now this frame will be split it into three channels let's add the option here of what the user wants to do let's add it as a key now if this key is equal to h meaning that i would like to modify the h i would do the following h open the list or the array h larger than limit is equal to 255 the same as we have explained we are checking all the values that are larger than limit and replacing it with 255. Next, we would like to update the values inside this h as well. So we will say h, h less or equal to limit is actually plus equal value. Meaning that all the values that are less than the limit will be added the value here that we are passing. Okay, we have talked about how this algorithm works already. Now let's continue. Let's do the same thing for all the keys. So if the key is equal to saturation, then I would like to change the saturation channel. Now same thing would be for the value. If the key is equal to value, I would like to change the values for all of these. Now we have changed the HSV values. Now it's time to merge them back. How can we do that? We just use a function called merge. So we will say, hsv frame is equal to cv2.merge and let's pass them as a tuple h s and v we are recreating the image after we have decomposed it and now we need to reconvert it to pgr or rgb so we will say frame is equal to cv2.cv2 color and then here we will say hsv frame and the converter, which is cv2.color underscore hsv to bgr. And then we are returning the frame. Okay, now let's comment out these that we have used before. We don't want to flip, we don't want to do anything. We just want to change hsv. So we're going to call hsv change. We will pass it the frame. Let's say we want to add 50. And let's say we are changing s value okay let's test this out now we have changed the saturation let's increase the saturation to the max as you can see here we can see that the saturation has changed how about we change the hue to the max we will see that all the colors were distorted and this is what we are expecting when we change the hue let's change the value to the max as you can see, the whole video here was distorted because the value is too large. Let's increase it by 100. Well, you can see that the background as well, all its values are changed. Well, this is good. Now we can do the same thing for RGB as well. Right now, you have edited your video, you have done some image processing on every frame, and you would like to export it and save it. Well, let's see how we can do that. The first thing we are going to do is to get the size of, or the width and the height of our frames. The way to do that is by saying width is equal to convert to integer cap dot get, and then we will be passing cv2 dot cap underscore prop underscore frame underscore width okay this is an open cv function that will get you the frame width 
and here the height so we're gonna change width here to height and we're going to change width here to height as well okay the next thing is we need to create the extension so what is the extension we going to save our video in let's say we want to save it as an mb4 to do that let's just call this ex and we are going to say cv2 dot video writer underscore 4cc and here we are going to pass the following star and then we open a quotation and we say mp4v okay by that you are preparing how are you going to encode all of your video frames next we're not done yet we are going to call a variable here out and this out is going to equal to cv2 dot video writer now you need to name your video let's call it uh, logo edited dot mp4 next you need to pass this extension we have talked about we pass ex here then we pass number of frames let's assume they are 20 and here you need to pass the width and the height as a tuple so here we have width and we have height so here we have prepared the encoding of the video and here we are creating a video writer now we are going to be writing to this video writer so here after we are done processing our image after we are done with all processing we are going to say out dot write this is our out and we are calling the method write on it and we are passing a frame okay now after you are done you need to release this out or this video writer so we're going to say out dot release okay by that we are writing a video let's execute it now let's go and check this is my logo motion edited and as we can see this is the edited version by that we can import videos edit them and re-export them and we can create a simple or even complex video editor all right so let us now code some object tracking let's say that we have an object moving in a video like the opencv logo and we would like to track it in every frame so this is the opencv i want to put a box around it in every frame object tracking is used in many many applications let's say we have a video of cars passing in the traffic we can track every single car and see where it is going and we can identify these objects as well let's say we have multiple people walking in a field in a football field and they are playing football you can track every player and you can you can track every player in every frame in the video those are some advanced examples but this is the concept of how these tracking models are built okay now let's create a list of all the trackers that opencv supports so i'm gonna say here track type is equal to and i'm gonna mention all of them each one is different in terms of performance and how the algorithm works we have boosting we have mil we have KCF, we have TLD, we have something called median flow, we have go turn and MOS SE and CSRT. Okay, so those are the types that we have. Let's say that we are going to start with boosting. So I'm going to say here tracker is equal to track underscore type zero. So I am choosing from the list the element number zero, which is the boosting. Now let's say tracker is equal to cv2 dot legacy dot tracker boosting underscore create. Okay. Now I did this list just to give you an idea on all the trackers that we have. If you want to change this tracker from boosting to something else you just need to replace the boosting keyword okay now this is my tracker this is the first thing you want to do is to initialize a tracker now one of the important things that the tracker need is an initial box 
we need to create a box on our frame that will determine where is the initial position of this object. We can either find some way to get the exact coordinate of that box using some video editor or some uh, image editor program, or we can use the built-in function that OpenCV has. I'm going to show you how we can identify this box and pass it to the tracker. First, first, let us read only one frame. So we have read and frame just as usual, and we have cap.read. Uh, these need to be, of course, after we initialize the video capture, so they need to be here, okay? Now, we have read one frame. We can pass this frame to a method in OpenCV that is called selectroy or region of interest. So we would say, bounding box is equal to cv2 dot select roy pass a frame and i need you to pass false here this parameter is gonna specify if when i am creating a box do i want to create the box from the center or from where my mouse is now i'm gonna say red is equal to this is just a flag that the tracker will return if everything is okay so i'm gonna say red dot init frame b box so here the tracker need to be initialized with the first frame and with the bounding box of where the object is initially if everything is fine this will return true and red will be true okay now let's take a look on how this works as you can see we got a window called roy selector now all i need to do is just create a bounding box around my object okay if I press space, the program will continue working. But what happened is, this bounding box now is stored in BB box. So now let me show you if I pass true here. If I run it, now if I try to create a box, you will see that I will get a center cross with it as well. Okay? You can enable it or disable it, it's actually up to you. Now, after you're done labeling, just press space. After you press space, the program will continue executing. Okay, now this is how we create a ROI. So right now we have selected our region of interest, which is our object, and we initialized the tracker with it. Now let's jump to our loop. We will be reading one frame at a time. Now every time we read a frame, we are going to be updating the tracker. So here, let's remove this huge space. If we read a frame successfully, I would like to update my tracker. I'm going to create a flag called OK. And I need a bounding box. This OK is just the same as this red, but I want to distinguish them here. And this will equal to tracker dot update frame. I'm going to pass this new frame and I want a new bounding box coordinates. OK, so far we did not draw this bounding box in the video and we are going to be doing that. Now, if the tracker said that everything is fine, then I would like to start drawing the rectangle. To draw a rectangle on OpenCV, there is a method called rectangle, and we just need to pass it the frame where we are going to be drawing the rectangle and two points. To draw a rectangle, it's enough to have the upper left point and the bottom right point. Where are we going to get this? We will be getting it from this bounding box. We are already having all of this information. So I'm going to call the first point, which is the upper left one, P1. So P1 is actually nothing but BB box 0, the first X coordinate, and then we have BB box 1. Okay, this is it. Let's add indented block here. Okay, we're good. Now, point 2 is actually nothing but the summation of BB box 0 and BB box 2. By that, we can get the X coordinate of that rectangle, the bottom right corner. So we will open a tuple. And we are going to say BB box 0 plus BB box 2. And for the Y coordinate, it is BB box 1 plus BB box 3. Okay. All right. Now we got the two points we need. Now let's draw it. CV2 
dot rectangle and we need to pass it the frame point one point two the color let's choose any color let's say 255 0 and 80 and then the thickness of my rectangle line let's make it one okay now after this i'm gonna be showing my frame and then there is my else so that if the frame is not okay i'm gonna break out of this now let us test this i'm gonna be drawing a rectangle here okay so it seems that we have an issue in the coordinates let us correct this so here it's only complaining about the type so let us convert these to integers all of them i'm going to be casting these points to integers i thought we might get away with it but it seems that it's strict about it don't say that okay now let us try again i'm going to be choosing my rectangle here and as you can see the rectangle is following my object now we can also notice that the video is running slower than its original speed it means that this algorithm is not really that fast let's try a different algorithm let's try the most se instead of boosting let's see what would happen if i am to draw the rectangle you'll see that the algorithm is way faster that's really good so far we were working on single tracking meaning that we have one object and we are trying to track it frame by frame in more realistic scenarios we would be having multiple objects that we would like to track in the same video let us take a look at an example so this video we have two objects and they are moving in two different places around the video how about if i want to track them both so here the video is called to logo motion and it is in the attachment you can get it in order to follow along okay now let me change the name here now i am reading that video what do we need to exactly change in order to track multiple objects well first of all we need two bounding boxes to choose on the video so far we are calling select roy only once we need to call it twice and we also need to call a different method which is called multi-tracker the first step to do here is the following let's create a bounding box list i'm gonna call it boxes because whatever boxes i will be returning from select roy uh, i'm gonna be appending it to this bp boxes okay so we read the frame once and now we will be calling select roy and after that i want to append this so pp boxes dot append whatever bounding boxes this function has returned let's assume that i already know how many objects do i have i'm not going to create a fancy function in order to take unlimited number of boxes i'm just going to make things really simple i'm going to copy these and paste them like right here and we're done we have called select roy twice and we have abandoned the pb boxes now we don't need this function anymore so i'm gonna just comment it out and what i want to do here is call a multi-tracker so a multi-tracker here is the object i want to create it's called cv2 dot legacy dot multi tracker underscore create now the next step is to initialize it the way to initialize it is a little bit different and we need to initialize it for all the bp boxes so we need to create a for loop for b in bb boxes we're going to say multi tracker this multi tracker here which is this one and we need to call a method called add we are going to pass tracker here which is the tracker we have created before the most se tracker after we pass it we need to pass the frame and the bounding box one by one okay this is how we initialize it. now this is the first part the second part that we need to change is right here here we are updating only one box but here we have multiple boxes instead of tracker we are going to call 
multi tracker. So this is multi tracker dot update frame, and we're good. Now, finally, we need to draw all the boxes. Here we are drawing only one box. How can I do that? We are going to say for also b in. Let's rename this to box, okay, so that we don't have the same variable name for b in box, not m in box and we will be iterating that means this is not bb box anymore it's just b for all of those because the logic is the same but the variable name is now different now if we try to run this program and we create a box around the first object press space then the second object and press space we would see that we are only tracking one object. Now, why is that? This is one of the issues that I've seen a lot. And the reason of that lies in this line right here. We are using the same tracker. Remember when we created a tracker here? Well, for every object, we need to create its own tracker as well. So if we cut this, and just add it right here then for every bb box we are going to be creating a new tracker now if we hit on run and we select the first box and then the second box we will see now that we have two trackers running well that's really great now we can track multiple objects as long as the background is not too complicated All right, so right now we are going to talk about Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is an IDE that is used to program Python. So far we have been using Spider, but there is some advantages to move to stuff like Jupyter Notebook because Jupyter Notebook provides a good way to visualize your data while you are programming. So, and it also gives you the ability to write your code in multiple cells and then run them individually which is very useful in some scenarios so this is how it looks like now we are going to see how we can open a new jupyter notebook first off let's go to some directory that we would like to store our jupyter notebook in so let's say i want this directory you just need to go to it and just copy it next you need to open anaconda prompt just open the anaconda prompt like this and you'll be right here now all you need to do is to navigate to that directory right here in order to store our Jupyter notebook in so now the first thing you need to do is to change your directory your directory from c to d now if the directory you have in mind is already in c you don't need to do this step so i need to change this to d all i need to do is just type d and column and now I am in D and in this directory, okay? Now let's say that it did not automatically take you to that directory, what can you do? All you need to do is just type CD, it's a shortcut for change directory, and just click on the right mouse click because you have already, okay, I clicked twice here, yeah, because you have already copied it from uh, the path right here so when you just right click in the mouse you'll be pasting it in that command line now if i hit enter now this is my directory now all i need to do is just type jupyter notebook and this will open like this and we will be getting a new jupyter notebook now this is the list of all the files i have in that directory what i need is a Jupyter notebook. So these files that let's say I have in my directory, let's take a look. Right here it's a .py and Jupyter notebook has also its own format. So if I click on new, I can create a new Python 3 IP kernel and it opened. Now if I want to download this, I have I can download it in multiple formats. One of them is the IPYMB, which is the notebook format, or I can download it as a Py. Download it and save it, of course. Okay. So it's important to know that there are two types 
of Python files. When we are working with Jupyter Notebook, we can work with ipynb and with .py. The differences in between them is that this one is formatted to cells. So if you try to open this in Spider, you will get those cells as comments in order to keep this uh, Jupyter Notebook format. Okay, so now in the upcoming sections, we will be using Jupyter Notebook and we will see how powerful it is in visualizing data. All right, so what I'm gonna be doing right now is actually to learn some shortcuts when we are using Jupyter Notebook. First, we will be starting with one cell. Now, let's say I would like to have all my libraries and all my imports in one cell and my code in another cell. I could do this simply by saying here, let's say import the library called OS, okay? Now, let's say I wanna to move to a new cell without executing this. All I need to do is to just hit right here on this area of the cell and just click on B. By that, I have created a new cell. If you're not sure of the shortcuts, you can just go to insert and you will see the shortcut in order to create a new cell. It's important to hit on the left of the cell, not inside it, in order to be able to activate the shortcuts. Okay, let's say here that I would like to print hi. Okay, so now I have two cells and I can run them individually. Let's say I just want to run the import cell. All I need to do is just hit on shift enter. And by that, I have run this. Now it is imported. Now let's say I want to print the high. So I need also to press here, shift, enter, and I will be printing high. So it helps us to divide our code into small sections and just run them individually. You might ask, why is this important? Especially when you are prototyping, sometimes you don't want to rerun the whole code. You would like to keep some certain aspects of the code you might need to only run a specific chunk of code that is independent. You only would need, sometimes you only need to run a small chunk of code and this would be really helpful by using the cells. Now, let's say that I would like to delete this empty cell. What could I do? Well, just click on the cell on the left and double click D and it's gone, okay? Now, let's say I would like to insert a new cell above this one. Go to insert, check the shortcuts. Insert cell above is by pressing A. So just click here and press A and you have a new cell. Let's delete it, double D and we're done. As I said, if you have forgotten what, if you forgot what you need to press, all you need to do is just press these tabs here, the cell and the insert to see the shortcuts for inserting and for running the cells. Okay. Now, let's say you're done and you would like to download this job to notebook. Just click on file, download as, and if you want to open it again in job to notebook, I prefer that you save it as a notebook like this. It will be downloaded to the directory you have already set in your CMD, as we have seen in the previous tutorial. Okay. You can also download it as a Python file, and there are multiple other extensions that you could use right here.